Date and Dash, Better Date Than Never Series, Book 10, by Susan Hatler. Chapter 1 I'm not a woman who lives by many rules, but when I find one that works I stick to it. My one-strike hand you out dating policy had never failed me, which was why I had my license plate frame embossed with that saying. It's not that I'm picky, really, but life's too short to waste a day on a guy who's just going to let you down. Take my sophomore year in college, for example. Eight months of forgiving Rick Mulroney for strike after strike, then he dumped me for someone he deemed smarter and deeper. His exact words had been, Mary Ann, I want someone smarter and deeper, whose parents didn't name them after a character on Gilligan's Island. Ugh. I totally felt like Elle Woods and Legally Blonde, except four years getting a BA in liberal arts at Sacramento State University had been enough for me. No way would I torture myself with law school. I didn't need a man or a law degree, for that matter. My job at NGN Properties paid well enough, and they'd recently promoted me to assistant community director at our newly acquired apartment complex by Sacramento's university campus. I would have been super excited about life right now if only my boss hadn't hired Elliot Grant last month. Irritation washed over me just thinking his name. Elliot is our new leasing consultant and the boss's nephew, can you say nepotism, and he has to be the laziest person on earth. I'm not even exaggerating. The guy does the bare minimum in the office, and sometimes not even that much. Unfortunately, my boss adores her nephew and seems unaware of his lack of work ethic. And today Elliot had pushed my limits. My hands balled as I recalled how I'd overheard him tell our boss that he had organized the new neighborhood watch program even though he knew full well I was the one who'd put it together. But I couldn't tell my boss her nephew was a horrible liar because five minutes earlier she'd asked how Elliot was fitting in around here and I'd babbled on with praise because I hadn't had the heart to tell her he was a total slacker. If I'd known he'd take credit for my work then I never would have lied, but I obviously couldn't contradict myself now. Plus, when I'd overheard them I'd been eavesdropping, which my sister, Ginger, claimed was a bad habit of mine. But how else would I have known Elliot had stabbed me in the back? I'd point that out to Ginger later. Right now I felt helpless and vulnerable, just like when I was seven and had nightmares. Back then I'd run to Grammy, who'd lived with us during her last year of life. Each time I came to her filled with terror, she'd clasp her beautiful jeweled bracelet around my wrist, telling me I'd have superpowers like Wonder Woman had with her wristbands. I knew nothing would hurt me when I wore that bracelet. If only I had the strength I'd felt back then. Needing my sister's comfort, and her food, since I'd blown the last of my groceries budget on a massage after work to decrease the stress of betrayal, Elliot, I jiggled my key in the front door of Ginger's condo. It always stuck, and I most definitely wasn't in the mood for that right now. When I'd lived here I had never bothered to lock the door, which was one of the reasons Ginger had given me the boot a couple months ago. Well, that and I might have been a bit behind on my share of the rent. Or maybe a lot behind. But, whatever. I'd paid her back once she'd alerted me that was a problem. She didn't have to kick me to the curb and get a replacement roommate. Not that I was still bitter. Much. Hello? I pushed the front door of Ginger's condo open, ready to wallow with my sister and her roommate, Melinda. Nobody answered, though, so I slipped into the small tiled entryway and shut the door behind me. Anyone home? Rough. Rough. Melinda's brown wiener dog charged through the living room with her ears flapping up and down. Then she jumped up on my gray slacks and began assaulting me with her wet tongue. Down, fudge. Down. Melinda's pup was not a good listener, but being smothered by her loving kisses wasn't exactly a hardship after the way my day had gone with that snake at work. Where did everyone go? Huh, girl? I crooned at her and got a face full of doggy tongue in response. I scooped fudge up in the crook of my arm and tossed my keys onto the entry table. After kicking my black heels off, I headed to the kitchen to root through the refrigerator. 
Ginger always had great leftovers and I was so going to eat them all right now. A note on the fridge reminded me that Melinda was at a charity auction with our friend Sarah. With the house empty, excluding adorable fudge, that meant Ginger must be out with her boyfriend, Greg. The fact that I hadn't been out on a date in a while poked at me, but there hadn't been any great guys lately. Ginger had, annoyingly, talked me into giving Liam, the last decent guy I'd dated, another chance after he'd already accumulated a strike. But then he'd acquired a tarantula as a pet. And, just, E.W. I set fudge on the kitchen floor and grabbed a plate from the cupboard, filling it with leftover naan and curry, which were Ginger's boyfriend's specialties. After grabbing a fork, I carried my delicious yummies back to the living room and dropped down on the sofa, ready to eat my food and veg out with some TV. As I reached for the remote on the coffee table, I noticed a brochure from Melinda's charity auction. Out of curiosity, I flipped open the first page to see what all the fuss was about. Most of the big-ticket items were listed near the front of the pamphlet. The first one that caught my eye was a vintage Cadillac that someone had restored and donated. I let out a low whistle. My dad would love that ride. Too bad I didn't make enough money to even buy the fender off of it. I paged through the brochure as I munched on the leftovers, practically moaning at the delicious flavors sliding over my taste buds. My sister's boyfriend, Greg, made the best Indian food ever. I took another bite as I turned the page, then choked on my bread. As I coughed and sputtered with tears stinging my eyes, I gaped down at the auction item in shock. Displayed on page 3 was a glamour photo of auction item number 64, Grammy's jewel bracelet. I recognized the design immediately, connected gold circles, each with a sparkling ruby in its center encrusted by diamonds, and knew it was Grammy's, because she had commissioned her favorite jeweler to create a one-of-a-kind bracelet on the anniversary of my grandfather's death. She told me that Grampy had wanted her to splurge on something special after he passed on, and it still was the most beautiful piece of jewelry I had ever seen. Closing my eyes, I pictured her wrapping the bracelet around my wrist. A serene feeling came over me, making me feel strong. After Grammy had died, I'd still felt her presence when I'd secretly worn that bracelet, and it had comforted me. My mom had sold the heirloom when I was nine because we needed the money. Whoever had bought it must have been local, and decided to donate the bracelet to charity. How amazing to see that beautiful bracelet again. My chest tightened. Actually, now that I thought about it, this was pretty much a downer. This would be the last time I'd see the bracelet again. Someone with oodles of money to blow would bid on the bracelet and poof. It would be gone. Forever. Peering closer at the page, I saw the bracelet was on sale for $5,000. I blinked. The tension in my chest shifted, and a sense of excitement took over as an idea began percolating in my brain. Five thousand was exactly how much room I had on my card right now. That had to be a sign. I knew Ginger wouldn't approve if I charged the bracelet on my credit card, but she never knew what had happened to me that awful day when I was seven. Or how Grammy had made me feel safe and strong with this bracelet. Yeah. I wasn't a kid anymore and I'd stopped dressing up like Wonder Woman two decades ago, but just looking at her special bracelet filled me with that same powerful feeling. My heart pounded in my chest as the realization hit me. I could actually buy back this heirloom if I hurried down to the auction in time. Leaving my half-eaten dinner on the coffee table, I raced to Ginger's room and threw open her closet. I grabbed the first thing I saw, which was a black cocktail dress that was far too conservative for my taste. I shimmied out of my work clothes and pulled the dress over my head. Gazing at my reflection in Ginger's bathroom mirror, I shuddered. My usually bouncy honey blonde curls hung limply after my long day at the office. My tall sister's dress hung on me in a frumpy way, instead of showing off my petite figure. So not flattering. My blue eyes widened, knowing I had no time to search for another dress let alone a moment to fluff my hair. This pathetic look would have to do. 
I strode to the entryway, snatched my keys off the table, and slipped into my heels. At least I hadn't worn flats to work. Then I raced out the door to my car. Checking my watch I saw that I only had 30 minutes before the live auction began and it would take me 20 minutes to get across town to the Jeffreys Hotel, where the auction was being held. I pulled into traffic typical for a Friday night and grumbled under my breath as I sat stuck behind a stream of cars and their red taillights. Tension filled every pore of my body. All I could think about was Grammy's bracelet, auction item number 64. A traffic jam was unacceptable right now. It was beyond serendipitous that Grammy's bracelet had shown up on the exact day I was feeling powerless, 17 years after it had been sold. My breath caught as I realized that an hour from now I could have that bracelet on my wrist and feel secure again, as if Grammy still had her hand in my life. Glancing over my shoulder, I turned onto a side street and was relieved to see there was relatively little traffic in this direction. I'd brought the auction brochure with me and wanted to see the bracelet again, so I flipped through the pamphlet until I got to page 3. There it was right before my eyes. The impact came before I could even lift my head. I jolted against the steering wheel and slammed on my brakes. I glanced up, my eyes bulging. Oh, no. I'd rear-ended the car in front of me. I rolled my neck around in a circle, but other than feeling embarrassed, I didn't seem to be hurt. Hopefully the same was true for the other driver since I hadn't been moving fast at all. Humiliated, I watched the car in front of me move forward, then park against the curb. Lifting my shaky foot off the brake, I pulled my car up behind the really nice vintage Mustang I'd hit, then grabbed my purse and pushed my door open. Just as my heels clacked against the pavement, the driver of the other vehicle stepped out, and I stared at the very definition of tall, dark, and handsome standing on the road. The man, slash, my victim, looked swoonworthy in a tuxedo that seemed tailored to his muscular build. He had dark hair, the short strands combed forward with a sideways boost in the front, giving him a sexy styled look. He had a wide brow and as I walked numbly toward him, I found his blue-gray eyes peering back at me. I checked his front passenger seat to see if he had anyone with him aka a date-slash-mood killer, but the car was empty. I sucked in a breath as he walked toward me. Hoping he was flying solo in that tux tonight, I smoothed down my honey-blonde mane, wishing I'd taken an extra minute to run Ginger's hairbrush through my hair and dab on my pink lip gloss. Sure, this accident created a minor delay, but maybe I'd get a hot date out of it. At this moment, I felt doubly grateful to Grammy. I am so sorry. I puckered my lips and tilted my head in a way that had earned me many date invitations. Then I brought my pink manicured hand to my chest. This was totally my fault. I was distracted, but I'm not injured. You're not hurt are you? No he gave me an unreadable look, then his brows drew together. Wow. Even irritation looked good on him. There's quite a lot of damage to my car, though, he said, his voice low and gravelly, but, sadly, not so friendly. Huh. Weird that my infamous pout had failed me. Needed to try a new tactic fast, because time was ticking and I had an auction to get to. I glanced at his shiny black car, recognizing the vintage Mustang my dad had once drooled over. Men tended to find auto knowledge appealing. Oh! Is that a Mustang? I asked, hoping to gain points. His brows tightened. It's a 65 coupe, which was in pristine condition when I pulled it out of my garage this evening. Strike two for me. Odd. I pulled up my most charming smile as I fished through my wallet. Well, I'm sure we can get that all worked out. Look, here's my insurance card. Since our bumpers have already met, maybe we should, too. I'm Mary Ann Nielsen, and this is my business card. You can call me any time. But right now I'm late, so if you'll excuse me. I'm late, too, but we need to file a police report due to the extensive damage. 
He accepted my business card, but was still frowning. Do you really think that's necessary? I mean, my car's dented too, but the insurance company will pay to fix it. I stared into blue-gray eyes that were way too sexy to be on someone so annoying. But I could tell Mr. Stuffy wasn't going to budge. Strike one for him, and he hadn't even asked me out yet. With a quick exhale, I regrouped then gave him a tight smile. Fine. You'll have to excuse me for a minute though, mister. I'm Trevor Brooks. He reached to shake my hand, clasping his warm grip around mine, sending shivers up my arm. Major sparkage. Maybe I should consider retracting his strike. Well, Trevor Brooks, pardon me for a moment. I need to make a quick phone call. I kept my smile bright. Just because he was making me late for the auction didn't mean I wanted to spoil my chances with him completely. I pulled my cell phone out of my purse, wondering if I could track down Ginger to place the bid at the auction for me. No, she'd just lecture me about spending too much money. I'll call the police, Trevor said, clearly not paying attention to me. Strike two for him, not that he seemed to care. He merely ambled closer to his car again, examining the damage with his hand. I felt a twinge of guilt. Can't we meet later to file the report together? I sighed, wanting to hurry so I wouldn't lose my chance to buy Grammy's bracelet. He shook his head. We need the police officer to examine the accident scene for the report. And, strike three for Trevor. Fine, I reluctantly agreed, even though Mr. Stuffy was already pulling out his phone. I was going to miss the live auction, so I needed to think of a new plan of attack. If I called Melinda, I could ask her to bid on the bracelet for me. I didn't care how I got the bracelet, as long as it became mine. She answered her phone on the second ring. Mary Ann. She'd used a hushed tone, and I could hear the chatter of voices in the background. I can't talk right now. I'm at a charity auction with Sarah. Her friend Jill runs a homeless outreach program called Founding Friendships, and the auction is to raise money for the program. Isn't that cool? I'm bidding on a gorgeous fountain for my bakery's upstairs terrace. Awesome! I squealed, momentarily distracted by the fabulous vision of a fountain on her bakery's rooftop terrace. What a perfect addition to the space. Then I shook my head, remembering the reason I'd called her. I need a huge favor. I'm actually on my way to the Jeffreys Hotel for the auction, but I'm running late. Would you bid on an item at the live auction for me? Pretty please? Oh, yeah. Sure. Her voice was low but tense. But tell me what you want quickly, because they're starting the live auction now and a red convertible Toyota Miata and a black 65 Mustang Coupe. Trevor's tone bellowed through the warm evening air, interrupting my conversation with Melinda. Then he chuckled, the corners of his eyes crinkling in an adorable way. Yeah, the Coupe's mine. The 65 is my favorite, too. I rolled my eyes. Sure, be nice to some stranger on the phone but completely rebuff my flirtatious efforts. Whatever. I may have lost a potential date, but at least Grammy's bracelet would be mine. I could almost feel the cool metal around my wrist. Mary Ann? You still there? Melinda asked. Yes, I said, moving my lips closer to the mouthpiece as I plugged my other ear to drown out Trevor's annoying conversation about vintage Mustangs. Bid on auction number 65 for me, okay? This is super important. Number 65. Just offer all I have, $5,000, from the start because I can't risk losing out. From the corner of my eye, I saw Trevor pulling his phone away from his ear, and I frowned. He'd really buttered up the cop with that coupe talk, and I hoped I wouldn't get a ticket. I really couldn't afford that on top of the bracelet. Melinda? 
Mary Ann, I got it. 65. I'll bid $5,000. And, if you win, you can just pay for the auction when you arrive. Gotta run now. Thanks. Bye. I pressed the off button on my phone, then turned back to Trevor. You are being ridiculous making me stay here, you know. They call it an accident for a reason, and my insurance will take care of the damage. There are also reasons these procedures are in place. I'm late, too, but I'm willing to wait so I can do the right thing. He adjusted the tie at his neck, and I noticed again how hot he looked in his tux. But he'd already accumulated three strikes, so he clearly wasn't worth my time. How someone so attractive can be so stuffy is beyond me, I blurted. Trevor laughed. He actually laughed at my misery. I'm tickled to amuse you. Really? My eyes narrowed and I puckered my lips. What a complete waste of a perfectly gorgeous man. I sighed and turned away while he sauntered over to the cars again. I tried not to notice how beautifully he walked. Broad-shouldered and powerful. The police arrived quickly, asked us a few questions, and did their thing. I held my breath the entire time but thankfully wasn't issued a ticket. Apparently, the cops appreciated my smiles more than Trevor Brooks did. Well, it would have been nice to meet you under more pleasant circumstances, Trevor said, the corner of his mouth lifting into a sexy half-smile. My belly did a little flip, which I promptly tried to quash down. Did he really think he could flirt with me after making me miss the auction for his lame report? Dream on. Three strikes and he was so out. I raised my brow. Well, Trevor, if you have any other issues, please call my insurance company, not me. Got it. He chuckled, seeming unperturbed by my rejection. Whatever. I spun on my heel and felt his eyes burning against my back as I trotted off to my car. I slipped behind the wheel, hoping Melinda had won the auction for me. As I pulled away from the curb, I fought my urge to glance over at Trevor and lost. He stood in the same spot where I'd left him, with one hand in his pocket, and when my gaze shot to his, the corner of his mouth curved upward. My cheeks heated, and I hated that he'd caught me checking him out, especially after I'd tried to play it cool with the whole call my insurance, not me line. What an excruciatingly annoying man. Why hadn't I had the self-control not to look back at him? I sped down the street toward the auction, hoping more than ever that I'd won back Grammy's bracelet. Chapter 2 I gripped the steering wheel tightly as I finished the drive to the charity auction, trying to push the car accident and especially the driver I'd rear-ended out of my mind. How annoying was Trevor Brooks to insist on a police report for a minor fender bender? He was even more annoying for not responding to my flirting. I mean, he'd be lucky to go out with a woman like me. I was nice, fun, and men always found me adorable. So what was his problem? And why did I care? After finding a tight parking spot on the street near the Jeffreys Hotel where the auction was being held, I parallel parked my little Miata, then hopped out of my car. My heels clacked along the sidewalk as I hurried toward the entrance of the hotel, where a doorman greeted me. I smiled back at him, then dialed Melinda's cell number as I walked into the lobby, but the call went directly to voicemail. Ugh. I wanted her to confirm I'd won the bracelet. Maybe she'd be waiting for me at the redemption table. I gazed around the lobby, which was elegant with polished marble and dark wood. After getting directions from the guy behind the concierge desk, I anxiously walked down the hallway, then into the grand ballroom. Fancy-dressed people milled about, and their voices buzzed throughout the room over the soft classical music playing in the background. I didn't see Melinda in the crowd, but I found the redemption table easily. I gave the man my name and waited while he pulled up my win on the laptop in front of him. My stomach clenched and I closed my eyes, so ready for him to confirm I'd won Grammy's bracelet back. 
Never mind that Ginger would lecture me on charging five grand for a piece of jewelry because I was moments away from clasping that special bracelet around my wrist, then I'd feel safe and strong like I could handle anything, including that backstabbing liar Elliot Grant. Ah, here we are. The man behind the table tapped on his keyboard and nodded. Number 65, a bachelor's date for the reality TV special of the week, called Romance Revealed. My eyes widened. Huh? Sounded like a great hook for a TV series. I'd watch it. Then I shook my head, realizing I was getting sidetracked. I'm sorry, but I didn't bid to be some random guy's date. I waved my finger back and forth. You've got me mixed up with someone else. I need to pay for my auction item. Number 64. It's a ruby and diamond bracelet, I said, feeling antsier by the minute. No, I've got your name right here. Marion Nielsen, auction item number 65. You won a week of dates with The Bachelor for the couple's competition. I tilted my head, puckering my lips. Why in the world would I want to be in a couple's competition? The man scrunched up his face. Why wouldn't you? You're single, right? And the winning couple gets $50,000. I threw up my hands in frustration. I don't get what's going on here. Well, you go out on four dates with the bachelor you won. You'll be filmed over the course of your dates. You and your bachelor will be competing against several other couples, and the winning couple gets $50,000 as the prize. That's pretty easy money. And who knows? Maybe you'll find a love connection, the man said with a chuckle. My jaw fell open, because he didn't appear to be joking. He cleared his throat. Your auction item will be $5,000, and we do accept credit cards. The man glanced over my shoulder, then smiled broadly. Here comes your bachelor now. Trevor, over here, he said, waving eagerly. I need you to sign some papers. I twisted around, and my breath caught in my throat. Trevor Brooks was coming toward us, eyeing me with curiosity. My stomach did a funny flip. The guy looked even hotter now than he had on the street after I'd rear-ended him. My head started my flirtatious tilt, and I had to remind myself that he'd already shot me down. My brain scrambled. Reality TV show couples competition? Trevor Brooks as my date? No way. I'd told Melinda to bid on my grandmother's bracelet. What had possessed her to bid on a bachelor auction? I whirled back around toward the table as I sensed Trevor come up beside me, panic rising in my chest. I peered at the name tag of the man behind the table. Listen, Chuck. May I call you Chuck? I gave him an impatient look as he handed Trevor some papers, then finally faced me. Here's the thing. My friend must have bid on the wrong auction item for me. I can't pay for a lousy date, especially not with a guy like him. I jerked my thumb in Trevor's direction. I came here to buy a jeweled bracelet. You can help me with this obvious misunderstanding, right? Chuck shifted in his seat and began fidgeting with the papers in front of him. Well, miss, the thing is, um, he cleared his throat, then inhaled audibly. I can't just let you out of your financial commitment. This is a charity auction for founding friendships. All of the money goes to help the issue of homelessness here in the city. Right, I get that. I nodded enthusiastically, and maybe a little drastically since every muscle in my body had tightened to the point that I might pop like a balloon if pricked. I don't want to take back my money, I just want to switch it to a different item, the correct item, which is a ruby and diamond bracelet. Miss, that's just not possible. The live auction is over. And besides, according to my records, another person already won that item. Chuck spoke in a firm voice, but he refused to look at me, so I knew he felt bad for my obvious turmoil. 
Thoughts raced through my mind as I tried to think of the correct thing to say to get Chuck on my side and make this right. Mary Ann, you made it, a familiar female voice came from behind me. I spun around to see Melinda striding toward us. She wore a black cocktail dress, one way sexier than mine, and her blonde hair pulled up in a twist, and she was sporting a huge smile. Congratulations! She stepped between Trevor, who was signing papers, and me, then wrapped an arm around my shoulders and squeezed. You got the top bid like you wanted. Sarah's bidding on a silent auction, but she's stoked for you, too. My eyes widened. You're joking, right? This has to be some kind of joke. Melinda's smile faded. What do you mean? I asked you to bid $5,000 on item 65. But this guy, Chuck, is claiming I won some series of dates with a bachelor. My gaze darted to Trevor who looked up from the papers he was holding, brows knitted as if assessing the situation. He says I'm supposed to go on a bunch of dates with that guy right there. Right. Melinda glanced at Trevor, then her face lit up. I recognize him from the life-size poster on stage during the live auction. He wasn't present while I was bidding, some kind of delay the auctioneer said, but now here he is in person. I pressed a hand to my forehead. But I didn't want a date. I asked you to bid on a diamond bracelet. Auction number 65. Uh, miss? Chuck's voice sounded hesitant. I turned toward him, not even trying to hide my annoyance. What do you want, Chuck? You did win item 65, he said in a timid voice. He twisted his computer screen toward me. I stepped closer, bent down, and read the words on the screen. My heart sank. H. How can that be? I stammered. My name was listed beside item 65, which was the date with Trevor, or whatever nonsense I had won. 65 should be a jeweled bracelet. I grabbed the auction brochure lying on the table and flipped through it frantically. When I got to the page with Grammy's bracelet, I stopped and stared in horror. I got it wrong. The bracelet is 64. What in the world made me say 65? I asked, then the realization hit me like two bumpers colliding in a car accident. My gaze shot to Trevor's, and our eyes locked. Your 65 Mustang Coupe. You kept talking about your 65 Mustang on the phone while I was giving Melinda my bid so I got mixed up. Chuck whistled. The 65 Mustang Coupe is a sweet car. Thanks, man. Trevor nodded at him. Unfortunately, it has a not-so-sweet dent in the rear bumper since someone rear-ended me earlier. Trevor's gaze landed on me, then all the others followed him, making it obvious I was the offending driver. Great. I blew out an exasperated breath. Well, I was just trying to get here quickly to buy auction item 64. I certainly didn't mean to hit your car, and under no circumstances would I intentionally buy dates with you. I thrust my hand to my hip, ignoring how sexy he looked narrowing his eyes at me. As if. Melinda glanced from Trevor to me, then back to Trevor again. Finally she held her hand out to him. Hi, I'm Melinda. I guess I'm partially the reason you have some upcoming dates with Marianne. Trevor shook her hand, but a line appeared between his brows. How's that? Melinda flushed. I bid on your auction for my friend here. I thought that five grand was a lot to bid on dates with a bachelor, but figured you must have met in person and she really liked you. He gave me a side glance. Judging by the daggers she's sending me with her eyes, I'd say your assumption that she likes me is erroneous. I prefer men who aren't so stuffy, I shot back, then gaped at Melinda in disbelief, my next credit card statement flashing before my eyes. You think I'd purposely pay five grand for a series of televised dates? Five grand? Trevor asked, looking more than a little surprised. 
It was a really generous donation, Chuck broke in. The other bachelor only sold for $700. I groaned. Chuck, please stop talking. You are not making anything better here. Trying not to cry, I swallowed the bitter pill of reality. I had bid $5,000 for something that I really didn't want, and I had no one to blame but myself. Ginger was going to have a field day lecturing me over this. So, you're saying I have to date Mary and on Romance Revealed, even though she bid on me by accident? Trevor's tone didn't exactly scream excitement over this prospect. Melinda leaned toward me and whispered, he's cute and seems really nice. You could have made a worse mistake. Just saying. I don't want to date him once, let alone for a week, I whispered back. I want my bracelet. Besides he's already struck out as far as I'm concerned. Ladies, I'm right here. Trevor's mouth formed a tight grin. I can hear everything you're saying, and your conversation doesn't improve our chances of winning the couple's competition. Look. I turned toward him. I appreciate that you're here as a volunteer bachelor or whatever, and that all the money goes to a great cause. We already know that we aren't compatible, though, so what would even be the point of going out? On TV, no less? Yeah, Marion does have her two strikes and you're out dating policy. What did you do to get your strikes, anyway? Melinda's voice was laced with curiosity. I rolled my eyes. It's a one strike and you're out policy. That's harsh, Trevor said, but the corners of his mouth twitched. You would have been lucky to get a date with me, Mr. Stuffy, but you were only concerned about your police report. So you can date that for all I care. Trevor laughed. Well, that would certainly make an interesting twist for the show. And at least the report wouldn't give me strikes, or whatever. I sighed. My rule protected me from getting hurt, so I wasn't going to alter it now. Too bad, though, because he was kind of adorable. I'm sorry, but you'll have to excuse me. I really must find the person who snatched my bracelet. Before anyone could say anything, I left. I didn't know where I was going or who I was looking for, but I'd recognize my grandmother's bracelet if I saw it. I wove through the crowd keeping my mind only on the task at hand. If I thought too much about Trevor, then I'd feel bad for wanting out of my mistaken bid. I couldn't afford to feel bad. I was on a mission. After circling the ballroom twice, and skillfully avoiding the table with Chuck and the gang, I caught a glimpse of a woman holding and staring at what looked like Grammy's bracelet. Dodging people like I was a quarterback, I hurried toward the woman who stood near the ballroom's exit. Ma'am? I called, cupping the sides of my mouth like a bullhorn so I'd be heard above the music and chatter. Excuse me, ma'am? The woman twisted around, her mouth drawn into a tight bow of a frown. Are you talking to me? I stopped in front of her and nodded, feeling awkward. Did you, um, just buy that bracelet here tonight? I asked, my eyes glued to the gorgeous piece of jewelry. As a matter of fact, I did, the woman replied with the same tight, pinched sound in her voice that she wore on her face. Why do you ask? Could I see it, please? It's really important. I held my breath, waiting for her answer. She looked me up and down, then must have assessed I wasn't a psycho lunatic because she finally said, just for a moment. I really must be going. I understand. My fingers trembled as she laid the bracelet across my outstretched palm and I recognized its weight. Staring at the beautiful ruby and diamond heirloom that had belonged to my grandmother, an image of her wearing it appeared in my mind. I remembered her kind and caring expression as she'd taken it off and clasped the cool metal around my wrist when I'd come to her out of breath after a nightmare. The memory was so real and perfect that I could almost feel her standing next to me. Grammy, 
I whispered, a feeling of peace washing over me. It's as beautiful as I remember. Oh. Have you seen it before? The woman asked. She seemed to lighten up slightly when she realized that I was genuinely interested in the piece. This bracelet used to belong to my grandmother. Saying the words aloud broke the spell I'd been under, reminding me that I needed to get on with business. My mother had to sell it when I was a little girl, but I never forgot about it. And I meant to buy it here tonight. That didn't happen obviously. But I'd like to buy it from you now. For the full five thousand dollars, of course. The woman made a humming noise, her condescending tone crawling under my skin. Oh my dear, that's certainly not possible. A weighted feeling settled over my chest. Why not? She stared at me a moment, then reached out to take the bracelet back from me. The gentleman who designed this bracelet actually died two weeks ago. He was a genius. Now that he's gone, all of his creations have quadrupled in value. So this bracelet is now worth at least $20,000, she said. The air whooshed out of my lungs. But I don't have that much money. Her face softened slightly. I'm sorry that you have a sentimental attachment to this piece. I wish I could help you, but I'm a businesswoman and this is my livelihood. Here's my card, though. If you can come up with the money, I'd be happy to sell the bracelet to you if it's still available. Unable to speak, I swallowed the lump that had formed in my throat as I accepted the card from her, then stared at the fancy gold lettering spelling out the name of a well-known jewelry store in downtown Sacramento. I needed $20,000, and there was only one way to get it. As the woman walked away, taking my precious bracelet with her, I knew what I'd have to do. In order to get Grammy's bracelet, I'd not only have to date the man who had rejected me, but I'd have to convince a live audience I was in love with him. Chapter 3 I woke up with a knot in my stomach, last night's epic debacle bouncing around my brain. How could I have botched the bracelet bid so badly? Oh, yeah. Trevor Brooks and his vintage Mustang, that's how. Not only had he messed up my plans but I just had a very sexy dream about him, so delicious I had to fight the urge to close my eyes and try for a replay right now. Oh, man. I needed to snap out of it. In my dream, Trevor had driven me down the California coast to Blue Moon Bay in his vintage Mustang. The windows had been rolled down, my hair whipping around my face as I laughed. Then we'd embraced on the beach, rolling over and over on the sand, tasting each other with kisses I'd felt all over. Shiver. Hello, subconscious? Are you trying to torment me? The guy already rejected us, and he got three strikes. Oh, that reminded me. I'd have to call my insurance today and report the car accident. Not exactly the ideal conversation to pump me up to act gaga over Trevor this afternoon, which was when we'd begin filming the first segment of the reality TV special, Romance Revealed. Last night I'd signed all of the show's papers giving them permission to film me, or Trevor and me, or whatever. Ginger would totally lecture me if she found out I hadn't bothered to read the small stack, but I had not been in the mood to read boring legal documents. Not only had I lost Grammy's bracelet, but after Chuck handed me the papers to sign, he'd introduced Trevor and me to one of our competing couples, realtors Chase McDermott and Wendy Watts. And Trevor was way friendlier to Wendy than he was to me, even though I'd paid five grand to date him. So not fair. When I'd pointed this out to Trevor, he said he'd be happy to pay more attention to me if I'd stop telling everyone and their mother that I was only dating him by mistake. Um, was it my fault I'd run into Melinda's mom and her new husband, and that she'd asked how I was doing? With a sigh I pushed back the covers and dropped my feet to my bedroom carpet. Hard to believe I was about to embark on a reality TV special with Trevor today. Sure, I loved watching these kinds of shows and I'd fantasized starring in one more than once. 
But unlike my dream scenarios, there was no chance of me actually winning the hot guy since my dating policy dictated that Trevor had already struck out. Plus, he seemed more interested in proper procedures than flirting with me. Whatever. All I needed to do was win the competition, anyway. Cringing, I stumbled down the hall to the shower. The spray was cold as I stepped in and I yelped. That was another thing I missed about living with Ginger, the hot water. Yeah, rent with my roommate was cheap, but who had time to wait for the water to heat up? After the water had frozen the blood in my veins, which sadly did nothing to turn down the heat on my annoying attraction to Trevor, I grabbed a toaster pastry from my kitchen cabinet and studied the business card the woman from the auction had given me. I needed to go see Grammy's bracelet again. That would reinforce my motivation to win this couple's competition, even if I did have to fake feelings for Mr. Stuffy. Hopefully the cameras wouldn't pick up that I had the hots for him. That would be a tad embarrassing. I stared at the address on the card, recognizing the area in downtown Sac where the jewelry store was located. But I'd never been there before. Too high-end for my tight wallet. I'd asked Melinda to meet me at the store at 10 o'clock and it was nearly that time already, so I hurried out the door not even bothering with makeup or taking the time to blow dry my hair. When I drove by the jewelry store in my Miata, I saw Melinda waiting out front. I waved to her, then parallel parked my car. The storefront was red brick and glass and chrome, which created a stunning modern feel. The store's fancy monogram was emblazoned on the glass front door, and elegantly arranged sparkling jewelry was displayed in the window cases on either side. Melinda let out a low whistle as I stepped out of the car. I groaned. Even she could see how out of place I was at this shop. It was hard to believe Grammy's bracelet was here, vulnerable to any rich woman's whim. I wanted to cry. Good morning, Mary Ann. Melinda gave me a long hug, seeming to sense how nervous I was feeling. You doing all right? I sniffed, then slipped my arm through hers. I've definitely been better. She patted my arm. I'm sorry again about the mix-up. Maybe you'll win this competition, claim your prize money, and the bracelet will be yours by next week. I'm so crossing fingers, I said, trying to stay positive as I stepped inside. Several salespeople greeted us when we entered the plush store. The interior was decorated in opulent jeweled tones, which was an interesting contrast to the way the store presented itself outside, and yet, it totally worked. I could almost feel the building telling me that I didn't belong, that I'd never understand what it meant to have money, and that it could chew me up and spit me out at any point. I shuddered, hoping I was wrong. Melinda wandered over to a counter display that held gold and green earrings. She leaned over the case and tapped a nail over an emerald earrings and necklace set. Those are gorgeous. I eyed the green gems, but felt no excitement. Not good. If I couldn't even enjoy window shopping, I'd certainly reached a new low. A distinguished-looking man with graying temples hurried over to us, wearing a smile. Those are Mendoza's finest work. Would you like to try them on? No, thank you. I shook my head, feeling lame that I had no idea who this Mendoza person was. I actually need to speak with the owner. She and I met last night to discuss a certain bracelet. Could you get her for me, please? right away. The man nodded, then disappeared into the back of the shop. My stomach twisted. I had to change the owner's mind about holding Grammy's bracelet for me for a week, to give me time to win the competition and get the prize money. Thinking of the competition, an image of Trevor popped into my mind. The way his dark hair complemented his serious-looking but sexy blue-gray eyes and the way he'd held and kissed me on the beach in my dream. I shivered, then hated myself for shivering. That annoying man might be totally gorgeous, but he was a pill. Not for me. So, how's your new job going? 
Melinda asked, pulling me from my thoughts. I dismissed the imaginary picture of Trevor and me on the sand from my mind, then wrinkled my nose. Work is positively and absolutely dreadful. Oh, no. Is the boss's lazy nephew still bugging you? Elliot is basically a heinous traitor. My voice was probably a wee bit too loud, since the other salesperson and her customer turned in my direction. Oops. Melinda raised a brow. Wow. What did he do now? I turned my back to the salesperson and her client, my stomach quailing as I thought of Elliot. He told my boss that he put together the Neighborhood Watch program even though he knows very well that I'm the one who coordinated that project. And, of course, she believed him. Yeah, I remember you saying she thinks he walks on air. Melinda knitted her brows. Why don't you tell her that you're the one who put the program together? Call him on his lie. I sighed, hardly able to believe I'd gotten myself into such a mess. Because I haven't told you the worst part. Literally minutes before he took credit for my work, she'd asked me how I thought he was working out at the office and I, I closed my eyes, then let my breath out slowly. I raved on about what a great job he's been doing. She shook her head, looking stunned. Why would you say that? I leaned against the counter and placed my hands on my cheeks. She loves her nephew and I just wanted her to feel good. Obviously a stupid move on my part, but I didn't know he'd lie and take credit for my work. Now she wouldn't believe me even if I told the truth. You can't let him get away with that, though. Melinda frowned for a second, then she brightened. You must have exchanged emails with the police department or whoever you worked with to put together the neighborhood watch program, right? If your boss doesn't believe you then you can show her the evidence. Yeah, but then she'll know I lied about how great he is. Plus, I was eavesdropping when I overheard their conversation. My throat tightened, remembering back to that awful day when I was seven, had done something I wasn't supposed to, then suffered the consequences. I'd never told anyone about that day, but now I longed to let out my guilt. Looking at my friend, I swallowed. When I do something bad, it feels like. May I help you? asked a cool, female voice, cutting me off. I glanced up, recognizing the woman from the auction who owned this posh jewelry store. My hands shook at my sides, but I wasn't sure why. Maybe from what I'd almost admitted to my friend or because I needed Grammy's bracelet so badly. Probably both. H. Hi. Do you remember me from the auction? I asked, hating the sound of desperation in my voice. Oh, yes. The corners of her mouth curved upward, and she motioned for us to follow her across the store where she gestured to a glass display case. I imagine you've come to purchase this bracelet by Arthur Arrington. I'm glad you came in right away. There are a limited number of his pieces available and I'm sure this would sell quickly. My stomach lurched as the urgency to claim the precious bracelet rose a notch. I glanced into the display case and my gaze latched onto the gold, ruby, and diamond bracelet displayed on a velvet holder. My heart stopped as I stared at Grammy's bracelet, which was literally within my reach. Well, if I had the key anyway. It's gorgeous. Melinda's arm brushed mine as she peered down, her blonde hair falling forward revealing a purple lock of hair. She used to be so stuffy about the way she looked, I was glad she'd added a bit of fun. I know. My eyes watered. I blinked the tears back and turned my attention to the owner, hoping the woman had a shred of mercy in her. I really need you to hold the bracelet for me until the end of the week. There's this reality TV competition I'm in, which airs next week, and I'll win the $20,000 to pay for the bracelet then. The corners of the woman's mouth turned downward. I'm sorry, but it's quite impossible for me to hold this item for you. And the bracelet is actually priced at $22,000. Oh, 
Come on, I blurted, gesturing toward the display case. You just bought it for five grand yesterday. This bracelet belongs to my grandmother, and it means the world to me. Have a heart. Didn't you have a grandma you adored while you were growing up? The woman's frown deepened. Actually, my grandmother used to lock me in the closet when I misbehaved. So I wasn't fond of her, no. Ouch. Bonding over beloved grandmothers was out. I decided to try a different tactic. What about that one special lovey that you held on to when you were scared? Didn't you have one of those? The muscle on her temple twitched. My father burned my teddy bear when I was six because they were afraid it contained germs from a highly contagious illness I had contracted. Actually, he burned most of my toys that day. After that experience I learned to rely on myself for comfort. But if you could have that teddy bear back, I started, then nearly jumped at the way her eyes darkened. Okay, emotion was not going to work with her either. Time to beg. Please. I laced my fingers together, squeezing my hands in prayer positions so hard that it hurt. It's just for a week. You can always sell the bracelet if I'm not back to claim it, so you have nothing to lose. I just need a little time. I'm sorry, she repeated. As I've already told you, I simply can't hold jewelry. This is a jewelry store, not a pawn shop. This bracelet is incredibly valuable now that the artist has passed away, and I'm not going to miss the opportunity of a sale just for sentimentality. Good day, ladies. I watched with a growing feeling of dread as the shop owner walked away. Come on. Melinda gently pulled on my elbow. Let's go. You need to get ready for the show. Letting her lead me out of the store, I knew with absolute certainty that winning the competition was the only way to get Grammy's bracelet back. Too bad I had to partner with the most handsome dud on the planet to win. I couldn't believe that I was going to have a starring role on the reality TV special, Romance Revealed. I understood the premise now, five couples, comprised of five men who had agreed to be auctioned off at different charity events and five women who had bid on them, competed against each other in front of the cameras for the chance to win $50,000. Even though I felt like a complete fraud participating in the show knowing full well no romance would be revealed in my case, wah, my half of the prize money would be enough to buy Grammy's bracelet, assuming it was still at that stingy woman's jewelry store a week from now. I had to believe it would be there, though. The thought of Grammy's special bracelet being sold off to a stranger filled me with angst. I absolutely had to win this competition. Voices clamored across the empty parking lot where we'd be filming shortly. All five of us couples had been prepped in makeup and hair, and the makeup girl had been flirting shamelessly with Trevor. Um, hello? He's here as my date, lady. A fake date, sure, but she didn't know our growing love was a sham. That's why I didn't feel bad shooting her lasers with my eyes until she backed off. We now stood next to our partners at the edge of the lot waiting for the next instructions. I'm your host, Brandon Baker. A handsome man wearing a suit clapped his hands over his head twice. He looked friendly enough and had the voice of a game show host. We start filming in ten. Just relax for a few. Relax? So not going to happen with a gazillion camera lenses pointing in my direction. I glanced sideways at Trevor. If he felt nervous at all, he was certainly doing a good job hiding it. My gaze traveled to the collared button-up shirt stretching across his broad chest. Mr. Stuffy had shown up in a black tie over a gray shirt. Could you get any more boring? I seriously hated how he could even make monochromatic look hot. Trevor looked down at me, so I forced my gaze away and decided to size up my, er, our, competition. Wendy and Chase, the realtors we'd already been introduced to, were freakishly in sync with one another. They both held their cell phones in their left hands and ran their right index fingers across their respective screens. 
Mike and Maggie, who we'd only met 10 minutes ago, would probably make a sweet couple, read, actual competition, if only they were able to actually look at each other. Can you say awkward first date? Jared and Sharon looked like they could hardly stand each other. He was frowning in her direction. She was turned away from him with her arms crossed. Pretty fast for a lover's quarrel. Ross and Evie were the couple that worried me most. They both had this intense demeanor and appeared as though they were here to win. To tell the truth, they actually looked a little scary like they'd come from the wrong side of the tracks, ready for a rumble. It wouldn't shock me if Evie was packing heat. There was even a strange bulge in the back of her shirt and jeans that seriously might be a gun. I got that my imagination was probably running wild, but still, I didn't want to find out. I scanned the set, which was arranged to look like a miniature forest. Trees ringed the perimeter, denser in some places than in others. On the other side of the field there was some sort of structure that I was pretty sure was supposed to be an abandoned house. You look nervous. Trevor nudged me with his elbow. Shivers ran up my arm, and I swallowed. I want to win. He kept his gaze on mine as an unreadable expression crossed his chiseled face. Me too, he said, his voice deep and gravelly. My belly fluttered as those two words vibrated through me. I reminded myself that he'd already struck out so this would only be a pretend infatuation, then I laced my arm through his. Let's do it then, hot stuff. You got it, muffin. A ripple of excitement fluttered through me, making me realize I enjoyed our endearing nicknames a little too much. So I leaned close to his ear to be out of microphone earshot. I'm only calling you hot stuff because, admittedly, you're gorgeous. But you're also stuffy. Thanks for the clarification. The corner of his mouth turned upward, and he moved his mouth so close to my ear his warm breath tickled my skin. Just so you know muffins are sweet, but they're also snippy calories. My lips puckered. Did you just call me snippy? He laughed, which needled me. He was so smug and annoying, yet I had to pretend like he was the greatest thing ever. Harumph. Couples, gather around please. The show's host, Brandon Baker, had used a megaphone to summon us to the corner of the vacant lot. He held his palms up and wiggled his fingers with a smile. Are you ready to have some fun? Mike and Maggie clapped and hooped, then their cheeks turned red at the same time. The rest of us clapped politely. Just then I caught the scary twenty-something woman named Evie giving me a cold smile, like she had it in for me. Settle down, everyone. Brandon Baker used a sing-song voice, so it was obvious he loved his job and was putting on a nice show for the cameras. Your first couple's competition will begin in 15 minutes for our first segment, Love Can Be Rough. Trevor and I exchanged a glance. Love can be rough? I hoped whatever we'd be doing wouldn't be too rough since I was wearing a baby pink dress I thought would complement my honey blonde hair on camera. Not exactly proper attire for roughing it in the trees. The wiggly fingers show host smiled. In keeping with our theme, the eight of you will be competing against each other in a paintball competition. There will be a few twists we'll throw at you while you are on the field so our viewers can see how you deal with stress and adversity. Stress and adversity? I much preferred words like day and spa. Will it bring you closer together as a couple? Or will it make your fledgling relationships fall apart? Brandon Baker moved his gaze from one person to the next, and I fought the urge to roll my eyes since my fledgling relationship had taken a nosedive when Trevor had chosen a police report in lieu of asking me out. You'll have ten minutes to confer with your date, to form a game plan. When the whistle sounds, you'll need to run, grab your stuff, and get to your designated safe area. Run where? Grab what stuff? And why did I need a designated area? Gulp. 
I hoped Trevor was forming our so-called plan right now because I didn't have a clue about paintball guns, and I also happened to be wearing heels. Please remember the rules. The host tapped his index finger to his temple and smiled brightly. Each of you will get either a regular paint gun or a paint gun that has been modified with certain surprises. You can take as many shots at your opponents as you want, but you can't shoot above the neck. Once you are hit, you are out. The last pair or person standing wins for their team. The first team completely eliminated will be out of the competition. When I say go you can stake out any area you choose. But you can't get into gear until the whistle blows and the first competition filming begins. Don't forget, no shooting until everyone's suited up safely. Ready, set, go couples, go! Immediately after the way too enthusiastic host stopped talking, Wendy and Chase rushed off, followed by Ross and Evie. Sharon took off, with Jared trailing after her looking very irritated. Mike and Maggie stood nearby looking just as confused as I felt. I turned to Trevor. So what's our game plan? He reached out, his fingers warm and slightly rough, and tilted my chin up. He stared into my eyes as if he were peering into my soul. To win. I gazed into his eyes, seconds ticking by, until he nudged me with his elbow. My cheeks heated. His touch had made me swoon way too much, and I couldn't afford to let him know how he affected me so I drew my brows together. Winning is a good plan, but we need to be way more detailed if we're going to beat them. I fought to ignore the heat stirring in my belly and nodded toward Ross and Evie, who were huddled together while Evie kept fingering the waistband of her jeans. Trevor slipped his arm around my shoulder and squeezed. Is it me or do they look like they might have criminal records? The heat in my belly flamed into a bonfire. Did he realize he'd touched me twice in under a minute? Was this an act for the cameras? Or was he as attracted to me as I was to him? I agree Ross and Evie are scary. I laughed nervously, loving the feel of his arm around me and really wishing I could take back Trevor's strikes. Then I remembered all of the, many, strikes my ex Rick Mulroney had accumulated. I had to hold my ground. My laughter died on my lips, and my mouth puckered. We really need to focus on a plan. Trevor studied me intently, and I squirmed under his assessing gaze. Why do you want to win so badly? My heart squeezed at his question. I need the money to buy the bracelet that I originally wanted to bid on at the auction. A strange expression flitted across his face, and I could guess what was going through his mind. He thought I was shallow. What did he know, though? My anger flared and I had to look away. Why? I snapped. What are you going to do with the money if we win? He let out an audible breath. I'm not going to blow it on a $5,000 piece of jewelry. That's for sure. I felt a pang in my gut that he'd talk about Grammy's bracelet as if it were just a piece of jewelry. But to be fair, he didn't know the story behind her bracelet and why it meant so much to me. The bracelet's going to cost me $22,000 now, thanks to your 65 Mustang talk branding my brain. I swallowed hard as I said the words. Even though I tried not to care what he thought of me, I found myself not wanting him to look down on me at the same time. I mean, I could understand where he was coming from. Dropping 22000 on a bracelet was grossly extravagant. It's not like I was going to the Academy Awards or something, nor did I have a Hollywood actor's salary. But it was the bracelet that Grammy had let me wear when I was scared, when, no, I wasn't going to go there. I turned back to Trevor. So what are you planning to do with your share of the money? He was quiet for a moment as he watched the other couples conferring. Finally he said, I'm going to donate it to Founding Friendships, the homeless outreach program. I pinched myself to see if I was awake. Yes, and ouch. Did I just hear you right? 
You're going to give away all of your winnings to the homeless? Who does that? He leveled me with his gaze. Me. I swallowed. Humbled. Wow. I hadn't meant my comment to come out as shallow, in actuality, I was incredibly grateful there were actually people like that out in the world. Was it possible for me to reverse strikes? Hard to know. It's not like I'd ever dated a guy before who did such awesome things. That's really generous. I continued to stare at him, and as I was looking at him something tugged at the back of my mind. Hadn't the whole auction at the Jeffreys Hotel been for founding friendships? Why did that charity mean so much to him that he'd donate $25,000 on top of the $5,000 he'd already raised from my bid? Not to mention him donating his time for this competition by pretending to date me when he clearly wasn't interested. Oh. There go Mike and Maggie, he said, interrupting my thoughts. I threw my hands out. Everyone's got a plan but us. And we don't even enjoy each other's company. His eyes lit up. I enjoy your company just fine, Muffin. Great, hot stuff. But so far, all we've secured are nicknames to fake our growing love. That's not going to win us this competition. What's our next move? We figure out how to use a paint gun. I always wanted to play paintball as a kid. That was the big thing when I was younger, especially in junior high. He sounded almost sad, and that made me curious. But you never played? Why not? I asked, glancing up at him. He shrugged. We never had the money. Now listen, I think we should circle the perimeter, stay out of the line of sight of the others, and check this thing out from all angles. Okay, I said, wishing he told me more and cringing at the thought of being shot with a paintball. That plan sounds safe. Hey, there's nothing wrong with safe, Trevor said. Trust me, I'm in risk management. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Risk management? So that's why you were so obsessed with the police report. I rolled my eyes this time. You have got to loosen up. Life's short. Have some fun. Suddenly the whistle blew, and I jumped. Despite my need to win, now that I knew all cameras had zoomed in on us, I froze. What if I biffed this couple's competition on national television? I'd be the laughingstock of this program. I knew how critical viewers would be of my performance, so I had to ace this event. If only I could get my feet to move. Don't worry. Trevor slipped his hand around mine and tugged me forward gently. If we stick together, we'll win this thing. I mumbled something unintelligible, then we raced to get our gear. Before we even got to our designated safe base area, I heard a paintball gun pop explosively through the air. That sound made me run faster, legs pumping as quickly as they could go. Luckily neither of us had been hit, but I knew it had to be Ross or Evie who had fired the first shot. They had been so intense in their mannerisms, and I suspected this wasn't the first time she'd been trigger happy. But how had they started already? We were supposed to be in our gear before we started, and there was no way they'd had time to suit up. Once we'd pulled on our protective gear, the host came up to us. He handed us a dark wooden box and told us to open it. I shoved it at Trevor. You open it. I don't want to get a face full of paint or whatever other surprises they're going to throw at us. Trevor clucked his tongue disapprovingly. Remember, we need to be getting along for the camera. Bossy is not an attractive trait. Just do it! I shrieked, fearing cameras were zooming in on me from all directions. Turning slightly, I plastered a grin on my face and said as loudly as I could, thank you so much for being such a gentleman. Taking one for the team. Anything for my muffin, Trevor replied as he pried the box top open. 
he gave me the goofiest grin I'd ever seen. I suppressed a giggle, while feigning concern as he peered into the box. Instead of getting a face full of paint or pie or whatever else they were cooking up for us, he reached into the box and pulled out a carton of eggs. We exchanged a confused look, then I peered into the box and saw a red card shaped like a heart. A white note was typed in its center. Use these as your ammunition, I read. A smile flitted across my face. I think we're supposed to shoot these at everyone. This might actually be fun, I said, imagining taking Ross and Evie out with eggs. How is this going to work? Trevor wondered aloud as he picked up his paintball gun and examined it. Ah. They rigged the gun. This reminds me of the potato guns and marshmallow shooters I had when I was a kid. I wonder what the other teams are getting. I shrugged. No idea. This is a first for me. He put his hand on my shoulder. Listen, stay low. We can use the trees to the north as protection. Go after Maggie first. Once you take her out, go after Wendy next. I'm going to try to get Ross and eliminate the strongest competition first. I wanted to argue with him and call out his bossiness but I didn't because I knew that the camera was on us and because my heart was pounding in my chest. As Trevor moved away from me, I reached out and grabbed his arm. My stomach flipped with excitement and I told myself it was just because we were about to start the game. When he turned to me with a confused expression, I stood on my tiptoes and gave him a peck on the cheek. Be careful, I said with just the right amount of pout. The corner of his mouth kicked up, then he dropped a kiss on my forehead. You, too. Again my stomach flitted, and I told myself that it was just nerves. I'd never been filmed before. Hopefully we made for good TV. I hung back, watching Trevor maneuver through the trees. The rest of the competitors seemed intent on getting one another and had all but forgotten about us. Or so it seemed. I knew better than to trust any of them at face value. I shoved an egg into my gun and moved after Trevor. I watched his broad shoulders as he slipped stealthily through the fake woods. Wow, he looked hot in camel-colored protective gear. Gazing across the tree-lined lot, I spotted Maggie cowering across the way. Mike had already been hit by what looked like paint balls mixed with sour, curdled milk. Black. My stomach heaved, and I actually felt sorry for the two of them since they looked so sad. They seemed like a nice couple, actually. It was too bad I wouldn't have a chance to get to know them. But in terms of the competition I was glad that they were easy outs. When I got close enough, I aimed at Maggie's thigh and fired. It was a square shot, and she went out with a tiny yelp. Trevor let out a cheer for my accomplishment. As he did I saw Ross whip around and fire off a round of paint balls in rapid succession, splattering bright yellow paint against Trevor's back. He glanced over at me dismayed, and I ducked behind a tree. My heart rate kicked up a notch, and my breath became ragged. Now that he'd been hit, it was all up to me. Peering out from behind the tree, I noticed that Sharon and Jared and Wendy and Chase were out, too. That meant that it was just Ross, Evie, and me left in the game. Gulp. Swallowing hard, I shoved another egg into my gun. I glanced over at where Trevor was sitting on the ground. His mouth was drawn tightly. Probably mad that he was out, which was actually pretty cute. I needed to stop thinking that way, though. I didn't like him for real. I needed to focus on winning. That was all. I crept out from behind the tree, intent on finding Evie. I knew I could avoid Ross for only a few moments, but then just as I was about to run for another stand of trees I felt the explosion of a paintball hit my shoulder. The pain blossomed immediately. Immediately I was hit from the other side as well. This time the paintball glanced off my jaw. I gasped. 
It felt like someone had sucker punched me. And that shot had been above the neck. I knew that was against the rules, but I was too busy being in pain to formulate the words to get them disqualified. The whistle blew again as Trevor raced over to me. Are you okay? He cupped my face in his hands, tipping my head back as he examined my cheek and jaw. I pulled away, feeling horrified that I'd been hit. No, I'm not all right. We lost. His eyes flicked over my chin one more time, then his gaze met mine. We didn't lose. Ross and Evie won and we came in second. So we move on to the next segment. We're not eliminated? A sense of relief flooded through me even as my chin throbbed and my heart slowed to a dull trot. Did you see who got me in the chin? I'll bet it was Ross or Evie, which means they cheated. They should be disqualified for hitting above the neck. I suspect it was them, too. But I didn't see it. If there aren't any witnesses, then we can't prove it. He glared in their direction as he spoke, and it was the first time since I'd met him that he looked ticked off. My eyes widened as I realized that I was enjoying his attention. Congratulations to the winning couples. Brandon Baker's voice boomed through the megaphone. Come gather around for the elimination ceremony. Before I even took a step, I glanced up at Trevor. That was way too close. We were almost eliminated. We need to step up our game. He nodded in agreement. Let's meet for coffee this week. We need to get a plan in place. My eyes widened, then I quickly regained composure. Had he just asked me out? No, he had to be just concerned for the win. A strategy session over coffee sounds great. I inhaled a deep breath. Then together we headed toward the host, ready to say goodbye to one unlucky couple. We'd survived the first segment. Three more to go. Chapter 4 my stomach nodded after the first segment of filming wrapped for romance revealed, but I assumed it was disappointment at coming in second place. I pressed my hands against my belly, then dropped my forehead against the steering wheel. Memories of Grammy handing me her bracelet all those nights when I'd been scared flooded through me. Suddenly, I pictured Trevor standing over me cupping my face in his hands like he'd done during the competition and the tension eased out of me. He was examining my chin, which I now knew had acquired a huge welt from the illegal paintball shot. That had to be attractive. Not. My stomach growled. Going home to my empty refrigerator didn't appeal to me, so I decided to head over to Ginger and Melinda's place. It was almost six in the evening and hopefully my sister would be cooking something good by now. I started my car and drove toward Ginger's condo, worrying about what she would say about my impulsiveness over the auction. I hadn't talked to her yet today, but I'd have to tell her when I saw her. Melinda might have spilled the beans already. Maybe Ginger would be as captivated by fate as I had been. The bracelet had landed back in our lives. Granted, it was going to be mine and not hers, but still, she'd have to see how serendipitous it all felt. When I arrived at her front door, I let myself in. Hi, I called as I slipped out of my heels. Anybody home? In here, Ginger answered back from the kitchen. I could smell something delicious cooking already. Yum. Prepping myself for the lecture I'd surely receive after I confessed about my accidental auction bid, I headed into the kitchen. Something smells yummy. I gave my sister a quick hug, then reached around her and snatched one of the cherry tomatoes she was slicing. I popped it into my mouth, savoring the burst of sweetness. Anything I can do to help? For real? My sister gave me a long look before pointing with the end of her knife. All right. How about slicing these onions? You got it. I grabbed another knife and went to the other cutting board that my sister had set up. 
Actually, she had four cutting boards placed at various points along the counter. She was a big believer in cleanliness, and when she cooked she used different bowls for each ingredient. Trevor would probably love her attention to detail. What had made me think of him again? Pushing him out of my mind, I sliced into the onion and my eyes started to burn. Soon my vision blurred and I wasn't sure if it was from the onion or not, but something released inside me as tears slipped down my face. It would be much easier to order takeout. Let someone else do all the work for us. That's one of the many reasons you don't have savings, Mary Ann. Ginger gave me a pointed look as I swiped at my cheeks with the back of my hand. Cooking your own food is cheaper and healthier. I fell silent as I continued my task, but her admonishment was too much of a reminder of what was coming and I was so not looking forward to her lecture. I sighed and set down the knife. This is boring. I walked over to the sink to wash my hands, and I could hear my sister heave a bigger sigh behind me. I splashed water over my red, must-be-swollen eyes, and gave a tiny smile as I heard my sister start chopping the onion on her own. So, Ginger's tone was long and drawn out in a way I knew well. Melinda told me about the auction. I half turned toward her, bracing for her reaction. She shook her head. Five thousand dollars, Mary Ann? Really? Defensiveness coiled up inside me. It's Grammy's bracelet. The one she had designed on the anniversary of Grampy's death. But you can't afford it, she pointed out, as if this were a no-brainer. Don't you remember how special it was? I clutched the dish towel between my bald fists, and I could hear the desperation in my voice. Just this once, I wanted my sister to understand where I was coming from. The memories of Grammy are what's important, not a bracelet priced at $5,000, my sister said. Normally that would be true about an expensive bracelet. I twisted my lips to the side. No way would I point out that it's now priced at $22,000. She'd freak for sure. But I'm sure Melinda told you about the dating show, right? If Trevor and I can win that, then I have $25,000 to blow. She gave me an exasperated look. You should never blow that kind of money. That's a substantial savings account. Don't you want to own a home one day? Yeah, when I'm married with kids. Right now I want to enjoy life, I said, thinking I'd enjoy life more with the feeling of strength and security that bracelet would give me. Then I could handle dealing with that rat Elliot, who I really didn't want to see at work on Monday. Plus, it'll be my money. After the hassles I'm going through with this dating competition, I'm going to spend that money any way I want. Sweetie, Melinda told me a little about this guy, Trevor. She thinks he seems like a nice guy. She paused, pushing the onions onto a pan sizzling on the stove. Maybe you should consider going out with him for real. You know I have a one-strike handy route dating policy. I slipped onto a bar stool, wringing the dish towel between my hands. And Trevor? Dude already has at least five strikes. Maybe more. I haven't decided yet. How can he have so many strikes if you aren't actually even dating him? I considered my sister's question for a moment. From her point of view I knew I seemed too impulsive. She had told me that so many times before I figured it was invisibly tattooed on my forehead. Still, she was my sister. Maybe she'd understand this time. Look, I'll give you an example. Strike one, he made us file a police report when I tapped his bumper. Can you believe that? Like, he didn't trust me to make good on the insurance claim. I gave him my business card. He could have called me and we could have taken care of it ourselves. Ginger glanced over her shoulder at me. You know that's the normal response to an accident, don't you? Whatever. And he works in risk management, but he doesn't even know how to take a risk. 
I flung my hands out, sending the towel flying toward my sister. It hit her in the back and she gave me a dirty look as she stooped to pick it up. You do know that the purpose of risk management is to manage risk, right? Thanks for the lesson. I flared my eyes. But I flirted with him after the accident and he didn't respond in the slightest. You mean he was being responsible? How dreadful. We stared at each other for a long moment, and then I said, he actually called Grammy's bracelet just a piece of jewelry. It is just a piece of jewelry. You're the one ascribing sentimental value to it. And you're the only one attached to it, too. She raised an eyebrow as she moved her spatula around the pan. You know, all of his strikes seem kind of ridiculous. Usually you pick guys whose strikes are legitimate. Remember that guy who insisted that he put his car to bed every night? I moaned. He had a car-sized pillow that he put under the hood, and a blanket. He even had a sheet that went over his garage floor. Yeah, he was pretty weird. But has Trevor done anything like that yet? Ginger asked. I stared at her. Well, no, but he has other strikes. Come on, Mary Ann. No one's perfect. So he ordered a police report rather than trusting a virtual stranger. That's normal. But a relationship is about give and take. I mean, look at you. You're impulsive. You get bored five seconds after you start anything. And money runs through your fingers like a sieve. She turned back to the stove as she listed my faults so she couldn't see the tears pool in my eyes. I rubbed them away quickly. Like I should listen to anything from you about a successful relationship. You had the perfect person fall for you the first time he met you. But I didn't give him a strike, Ginger said. Ha. You refused to date him for the longest time even when he bought the place upstairs. Yet he still adored you. A wistful expression crossed her features. I wouldn't date him because I was scared. Maybe that's your problem too. Well. How had she turned that around on me so quickly? Suddenly, my cell phone buzzed in my purse. I was happy for a distraction to responding to Ginger's annoying logic. It's not that I was scared to date Trevor, I just didn't want to waste my time like I had with Rick Mulroney. Scanning my cell screen, I saw a text from Trevor and a jolt of excitement shot through me. He wanted to firm down a time to meet for our strategy session. Who is it? she asked. It's Trevor, my date for the reality show. We're meeting tomorrow to strategize. You should see our competition. They're pretty tough. You're excited about him. Her voice sounded like she'd cracked a secret code. I blew out a breath. No, I'm not. I'm just excited that he wants to get into the game like I do. If we win then we'll split a pretty substantial prize. Duh. It's a no-brainer. She heaved a huge sigh. It's okay to like this guy. Me? Like stuffy Trevor? As if. Get the wax out of your ears and listen to me. I'm only pretending to like him in front of the cameras. It's about winning Grammy's bracelet. That's all. My sister chuckled condescendingly as she turned to the stove again. I could see her shaking her head, and I wanted to chuck a hunk of onion at her. The butterflies going crazy in my belly certainly were not because I was going to see Trevor tomorrow. They were only there due to getting one step closer to winning. That was all. Unfortunately, I was having a hard time convincing myself this was entirely true. Bernie's bakery was bustling on Sunday afternoon as I stepped through the doors to meet Trevor for our strategy session. Melinda actually owned this bakery and I adored coming here. She recently bought it after giving up her career as a customer service representative, which she'd never found fulfilling. 
I love the way the scent of coffee wrapped around me the moment I came inside this charming bakery in East Sacramento. Maybe I should get a job as a barista. Then I'd always smell good, and I wouldn't have to see Elliot Monday through Friday. Ugh. I looked around for Trevor, and my heart beat a little faster as I caught sight of him. The excitement of the competition was spilling into every other part of my life. Despite what Ginger thought, I wasn't going to fall for him just because we'd been thrown together for the competition. At least I had to try not to. My one strike hand you out policy was in place for a very good reason, and it would stand firm until I found the guy who could prove that he wasn't going to get any strikes right from the beginning. A stubborn game, perhaps, but one I was willing to play if it meant that my heart would remain safe. Trevor's face lit up in a smile when he saw me, and he waved me over to the table he'd claimed by one of the far windows. It was my favorite place to sit in the cafe and it gave me a gooey feeling inside that he'd chosen the same spot. As I threaded my way through the throng of people milling about, I took in Trevor's good looks for the hundredth time. His jaw was just short of being square, and it made his profile striking from any angle. His eyes were normally serious, but when he smiled they reminded me of a sunny day. Clearly he worked out because he was cut, and I couldn't keep my eyes off the way his biceps bulged from under his t-shirt. He looked hot in a suit or casual clothes and I decided it was fine to be attracted to him physically. That was a natural urge. My heart didn't have to be involved in those thoughts at all. It wasn't like I was going to act on my attraction, so no harm in enjoying the view while we did this show. I just needed to push out of my mind how worried he'd seemed when I'd been pelted on the chin by that bullet, which still smarted. Hi, Mary Ann. Trevor stood as I came over, then he pulled out the chair for me. I blinked, stunned. In all of my 26 years, I'd never had a guy pull a chair out for me. Maybe all of that risk management stuff just made him seem chivalrous, though. Like he needed to control every situation to minimize the risk. So by him pulling out the chair for me, he reduced the risk of my falling or knocking the chair over and causing someone to spill hot coffee on the person next to them. Or, um, maybe he was just a gentleman and I was overthinking things to try to find some flaw in order to fight my growing feelings for him. Either way, it was nice to be treated like I mattered for a change. May I get you something? He gestured toward the glass bakery counters, housing rows of goodies from tasty-looking pastries to various kinds of quiche. My treat. I was planning on ordering some food myself. I'm training for a marathon that raises money for charity. My daily training keeps my appetite up. I couldn't help but smile at his cuteness. He was raising money for charity again? So sweet! It seemed to be his life's mission, and it made me more than curious about why he felt so passionate about giving back so much. I'd love a mocha and maybe a biscotti. The biscotti here is divine. A mocha and a biscotti coming right up. The corners of his mouth turned upward in a way that almost made him look shy. I pressed my hands together on the table as I watched him head to the counter. He was being so nice to me, and part of me loved that. But the other part of me felt awkward and slightly suspicious. Whenever a guy was nice to me, he usually wanted something in return. Trevor didn't seem to have an ulterior motive, though, and my sister's suggestion that I give him a chance drifted through my mind. I quickly pushed that thought from my head. The goal was to win the competition, get the money, and buy Grammy's bracelet. Not fall for a guy who probably wasn't interested in me anyway. Here you go. Trevor returned a few minutes later with our coffee and food. He lifted his fork and dug into his plate, which was piled with quiche and fruit. I also noticed he'd taken my suggestion and ordered a biscotti for himself and for some reason that gesture made me all giddy inside. Thank you. I tilted my head, smiled, then dipped the biscotti into my mocha, waiting for it to soften slightly. I nibbled in silence for a few moments until I noticed Trevor studying me. My eyes widened. 
What? Do I have biscotti on my face? No, he shrugged, seeming embarrassed that I'd caught him watching me. You just seem different. Relaxed. Plus, you aren't trying to boss me around. My brows came together. Was that how he saw me? That certainly wasn't how I wanted to come across. But I also didn't want to tell him the real reason I was being quiet, that my darling sister had suggested that I give him a chance, but I didn't want him to stomp all over my heart. We should probably start plotting on how to win the reality show competition. All right. A tiny line formed between his brows. Since Jared and Sharon were eliminated in the last segment, I think Evie and Ross are our biggest competition. I nodded. I agree. Maggie and Mike are definitely in sync, but they seem nervous and distracted. That leaves Chase and Wendy, who I think are in the running too. Trevor forked off a piece of quiche, chewed thoughtfully, then swallowed. We obviously don't want to cheat like Evie and Ross, so we need to find a way to trump them even though they'll have the advantage by playing dirty. I gestured with my biscotti. How can we make a plan to beat them when we don't know what the next challenge is? He paused with his loaded fork halfway from plate to mouth. If you want that bracelet, you're going to have to trust me. I squinted at him. I don't know you well enough to trust you. Then get to know me, he said, making a very obvious point. Okay, Mr. Risk Management, I'll listen. I teased, raising an eyebrow at him. He set his fork down, then gave me a look so intense it made me shiver. To give us the best chance of winning in any situation, we need to focus on the ultimate goal of the show. Remember what that is? My belly fluttered. For us to fall in love. The corner of his mouth tipped up. Exactly. Producers are all about ratings, so the more we give them, the more they'll want to keep us around. The air left my lungs. The, um, more we give them? Did he want me to kiss him during the next segment? Because I was so willing to do that. Only for the ratings, of course. We need to show them our relationship is developing. He placed his hand over mine, rubbing his thumb across my skin. More physical contact would be good. Oh, wow. Was it hot in here all of a sudden? I leaned toward him, watching his eyes simmer. I can definitely do more physical contact. To, you know, give us an edge. His eyes went from simmering to downright smoldering. We should also look like we're connecting on a deeper level. Okay, this was getting too intense. I couldn't tell what he meant by a deeper level, but I certainly knew the way I wanted to connect with him on a deeper level, and that was so not appropriate for general television. I slowly slipped my hand away, then shoved the rest of the biscotti in my mouth in an effort to curb my cravings with sweets. A deeper level would be talking, right? Talking sounds safe. I mean good. I babbled through a mouthful of cookie, which sadly wasn't toning down my urge to kiss him. Why don't you tell me about your childhood? Okay. He eyed me inquisitively a moment, then his expression grew serious. I had a rough childhood. My parents did the best they could for my siblings and me, but sometimes money was tight. Beyond tight, actually. He inhaled deeply. There was a point where we were destitute. I paused mid-chew. Oh, man. And here I thought we were poor when my mom sold off Grammy's bracelet. Tight budget, perhaps. But we always got by in warm clothes and a nice house. I'm so sorry. It was hard. He nodded, twirling his fork around. That's the reason I went into the field of risk management, so I'd never be put in a position like that again. That's also why charities are so important to me. They help people get back on their feet. I nodded, 
resolving to up my own charity donations this year. He set his fork down. I grew up in a struggling family, but a loving one. After high school, I worked to put myself through college then started my career in risk management. Now I just want to make a difference in the world, you know? Wow. Trevor was pretty much the most amazing guy I'd ever met. He'd been destitute as a child but he hadn't let that stop him. Now I felt drawn to him even more. I couldn't tell if he was interested in me, though. He had opened up to me, bought my coffee and held my hand. But, then again, we were strategizing on how to up the show's ratings to gain an edge on winning. Ginger had been right that I should give Trevor a chance. I frowned, casting my eyes down. She always seemed to be right and I was the sister who messed things up. What's wrong? Trevor asked. My head snapped up. Huh? What do you mean? You have this look on your face like something's bothering you. He leaned forward slightly, and I was alarmed to realize how vulnerable I felt right now. I pressed my lips together and shook my head. Nothing's wrong. I'm fine. Just thinking about the competition. Come on. His voice was gentle and soothing. You can trust me. I won't judge. You have to be able to trust me if we have any shot at winning this thing. I hated how sweet his tone was, like he cared about what I had to say. Because it only made the growing feelings I had for him skyrocket. Finally, I expelled a long breath of air in a heavy sigh. I had a disagreement with my sister last night. Kind of related to this whole competition thing. Trevor was quiet for a minute. Does she not approve of reality shows? He was so off base that I almost laughed. No. What then? I held my coffee mug with both hands and squirmed in my seat. I couldn't tell Trevor we'd been discussing him. That would just be too embarrassing. But he was gazing at me so earnestly that I wanted to prove I did trust him too. Ginger didn't think I should have spent the money on the auction. She's always bugging me to get savings and I never seem to be able to because there's always something fun to spend money on. I bit my lip, thinking of Grammy's beautiful bracelet. I still wanted it desperately even though my sister didn't approve. Ginger always does the right thing. Actually you'd probably get along with her pretty well. Now it was his turn to laugh. I might be in risk management, but it's not like I have all of the answers. I just do the best I can. I don't. Tears pricked behind my eyes. Ginger says I'm too impulsive. And she's right. She's always right. It makes me feel like such a failure, I said, unable to believe I'd admitted that to him. Mary and his voice trailed off then his warm hands wrapped around mine even as I held the mug. I felt the jolt of attraction that I had been trying so hard to ignore, and I wondered if he felt it too. Please don't be so hard on yourself. I love your spontaneity. You have a zest for life that I wish I had. My mouth dropped open. Are you saying you want to be more like me? Is that so hard to believe? He chuckled. You're pretty terrific. And I'm sure your sister thinks you are, too. Don't give up on her too soon. Maybe she'll see things your way one of these days. I hope so, I said, my head spinning. All I could focus on was that Trevor had just said I was terrific. I so wanted him to clarify what that meant, but instead I just sat there with my mouth opening and closing like a guppy. No one ever took my side. Not since Grammy had died. My parents always saw how logical and responsible Ginger was, and how I was the exact opposite. I was impulsive. I was the family disappointment. But according to Trevor I was terrific. My tummy did a little flip. Mary Ann? 
His voice was low, gaze intent on mine. Yes? I bit my lip, wondering if he was going to take back everything he just said. He squeezed my hands, the corners of his mouth curving upward. I'm really glad we had this strategy session. Me too. I smiled, waiting for the tension to ooze out of me. But it didn't. Despite my internal reservations another piece of me had just fallen for Trevor. Although our new connection would be good for the show I knew from experience that my heart was so totally in danger. Chapter 5 I squinted into the sun as the contestants on Romance Revealed gathered in front of a gold miner statue in the middle of downtown Sacramento on Wednesday afternoon and smiled for the camera. We were doing a photo shoot for promo stuff before our next competition and the producers had even brought Jared and Sharon back for the pictures. I had no clue when or where the pictures were going to appear, but I must have given them permission in that stack of papers I'd signed after the auction. I'd had to take a half day from work to appear here, which was fine by me. Working with Elliot and pretending I didn't know he was a backstabbing tool was wreaking havoc on my nerves. Slipping my sunglasses back over my eyes, I tried to relax even though my stomach was in knots. Everywhere I looked cameras were pointing at all of us and I was afraid to so much as scratch my nose in case one of them zoomed in on me. So I put on a brilliant smile, trying to look good for the cameras. This was the first time I'd seen Trevor since we'd met at the cafe on Sunday and formed our strategy of appearing like we were connecting on a deeper level. I so was not going to have to fake anything in that department. We'd been texting almost non-stop, exchanging trivial facts about each other in case we needed it for the show. For instance, I now knew that his favorite color was aquamarine and he enjoyed rainy days. I also knew that he loved pasta, which he indulged in often for the carbs since he was a runner. He knew about my fear of hamsters, how cooking bored me to tears, and about my loathing of raw fish. Seriously, what was wrong with cooking food before you ate it? Well, as long as I wasn't the one cooking it, of course. I had also confessed that anyone could woo me with a slice of lemon meringue pie, especially if it was homemade. In truth, Trevor could forget the pie and woo me with one look. You're healing nicely, Muffin. He dropped a kiss on my chin where I'd been pelted with the paintball. I felt dizzy from the feel of his lips against my skin. Ready for whatever competition they throw at us? He asked. As long as it doesn't involve hamsters. I pressed my hand to my chin, touching the spot he'd kissed, which humped beneath my fingertips. He leaned down close to my ear. If you wipe off my kiss then people will think you don't like me. That would give the wrong impression. I, uh, my cheeks heated since the exact opposite was true. I'd been savoring his kiss and was so glad he didn't know that. How embarrassing. He was here to win money for charity not flirt with me for real. We were only faking our loving front and I needed to remember that or I was going to get hurt. Big time. Contestants, please gather around. Brandon Baker had shouted into a megaphone from where he stood on the opposite side of the statue in the small concrete park-like setting beneath the city's skyscrapers. Trevor slipped his arm around my waist, guiding me toward where everyone was gathering around our host. Maggie waved as we passed each other, and I smiled back. She and Mike seemed so cute together. Even though I wanted them to lose the competition, I hoped they would work out as a couple. I spotted Evie and quickly looked away from her. She and Ross had to have cheated at the love can be rough competition, which really ticked me off. But I didn't think it would help our chances of winning if I got grouchy with the cameras watching. Welcome to your second couple's competition, Clue into Love. Brandon Baker's voice held onto each word as he said them and he wore a huge smile. We all clapped and a few people cheered, including Trevor. I laughed at his enthusiasm, wondering if he was faking or not. For this segment, each couple will participate in a scavenger hunt that will take you to different points downtown. 
He handed out red heart-shaped envelopes to each couple as he spoke. The couple that makes it back here first after uncovering the clues will be declared the winner. I accepted the cutesy envelope, glancing up at Trevor. A scavenger hunt doesn't sound so bad. What does it say? He sounded like a little boy ready to open his birthday gifts and it made me giggle. Patience. I teased, then tore open the bright envelope and pulled out the card. Where do you go where everybody knows your name? I read. Trevor snapped his fingers. It's got to be a bar. But which one? I chewed my lower lip. Wait, it's coming to me. There's a bar near here that has TV memorabilia plastered to the walls. His right brow rose. Should I be worried about your knowledge of neighborhood bars? Are you going to be out bar hopping while I'm at home with the kids? I gave him an eye roll and laughed. That was all before I met you, hot stuff. Now, come on. We're wasting time. As I jogged off in the direction of the bar, Trevor slipped his hand around mine, guiding me in a different direction. We should take an alternate route so that no one can follow us. Good thinking. My stomach fluttered as we laced our fingers together. We rounded the corner and only a camera crew was following us. Trevor peered down at me. So, how many times have you been to this bar? Dozens, I said, smiling. Really? His tone sounded so surprised that I giggled again. Well, my parents did name my sister and me after TV sitcom characters. Do you know how many times I've been asked if I want to take a three-hour tour? The corners of his mouth tipped up. So are you going to do the same for our kids? My heart skipped at his talk of kids, even though I knew he was only saying it for the cameras. Absolutely not, I told him as I pointed to the door at the end of the block. After you. He pulled the door open, then gestured inside. We entered the bar, which was quiet at this time of day. But I knew from experience that it got packed after the dinner rush. I gazed around at the TV memorabilia lining the walls. The red vinyl bar stools always made me think of a 50s diner, and I wondered if I could get a milkshake instead of a martini. Hello? I called out, searching for a clue. Suddenly a man in a cupid mask popped out from behind the bar. I shrieked, stumbling backward and Trevor caught me in his arms. His chest was hard and strong against my back and I wanted to curl into him. What can I do for you? The guy laced his fingers under his chin and tilted his head. We're here for our next clue for the scavenger hunt, Trevor said, keeping an arm around me as he stepped toward the guy. The man promptly pulled out a red heart-shaped envelope, then stamped it with the time. Good luck! Trevor accepted the envelope and we hurried back out into the bright sunlight. Smile, someone shouted and I saw a photographer pop forward. I threw my arms around Trevor's middle. We did it! I squeezed. He took my cue, pulling me so close against him that my nose burrowed into his neck. I inhaled deeply and he smelled like pine. Delicious. When I finally pulled back, I peered up at him. What's our next clue? The corner of his mouth lifted as he tore open the envelope. Birds of a feather flock together. That's interesting. We walked aimlessly down the sidewalk, discussing what the clue might mean. After three blocks with no ideas, frustration settled in and we took a seat on the front stoop of a hardware store. The cameraman moved closer as we continued to mull over where we should go next. My stomach tightened. We were losing time and I was starting to panic but I couldn't think of anywhere downtown where we'd find birds flocking together. So lame. Trevor jumped up suddenly. I know where we need to go. Where? I asked, jogging beside him down the street. 
There's this pet store on J Street that sells exotic birds. It's actually more like an aviary. I used to hang out there a lot as a kid. He fell silent as we continued to power walk in the direction of the store, seeming to be deep in thought. So, what is your motivation to win? I asked. He glanced at me a moment then shrugged. I just really want to be able to donate my money to the Founding Friendship's Homeless Outreach Program. I gathered the real reason was something he didn't want to delve into with the camera following us, which was understandable. Well, it takes a really special person to donate that much money to charity. Especially with all the other things you do. Gazing into my eyes, he squeezed my hand in answer. He took being humble to the extreme, and I really admired him for it. Then he gestured to the store up ahead. Here we are, he said. The Wild Wings pet store was nothing spectacular from the outside but when we stepped in, I gasped. All manner of exotic birds flew freely over our heads up to an amazing atrium two stories high. Wow, I said softly. I know, right? Trevor agreed, smiling as he gazed around. A young boy's dream. I smiled at his obvious enjoyment, then hurried up to the counter since we'd lost a lot of time finding this clue. A gentle-looking old man with bushy white eyebrows was holding out a red heart-shaped envelope toward me. Thanks. I lingered for a moment to watch a blue, yellow, and green macaw soar and land on his shoulder. When we got outside we were greeted by another round of photographers. This time Trevor simply took my hand and we smiled for the lenses. Then he gave me the envelope. Your turn, Muffin. I slid my finger under the flap of the envelope, then pulled out the card. If you don't like having breakfast at Tiffany's then think about this place instead. I paused, realizing exactly where this clue was taking us. Oh, no. I know where we need to go. His blue-gray eyes surged mine. Isn't that a good thing? I swallowed hard, then forced myself to start moving in that direction. We need to go to the jewelry store where my grandmother's bracelet is. The bracelet from the auction? He watched me nod, then strolled along beside me in silence for a moment. My grandparents lived out of state. So I didn't get to see them often when I was a kid, but I loved them dearly. I had no idea about the bracelet and should never have belittled you for wanting your grandmother's bracelet back. You can't put a price on family heirlooms. I'm really sorry. Thanks. A lump formed in my throat, and I gave him a watery smile. We walked briskly a couple blocks with Trevor still holding my hand. I was glad for his support and that he understood how much Grammy's bracelet meant to me. Finally, I stopped across the street from the jewelry store I'd been at only a few days ago. I stared at the brick exterior, a feeling of dread settling over me. Trevor's hand tightened around mine. Look, it's Evie and Ross. We need to get in there before them. I can't. I stomped my foot down so hard in frustration the heel of my shoe broke. My eyes burned and I shook my head. What if her bracelet's gone? What if I'm too late? Trevor regarded me for a moment, and then he seemed to make a decision. I'll go in by myself. Wait here. I'll be back in a second. I watched him dart across the street, then disappear into the store. My heart pounded as I watched Ross and Evie run down the block and into the store as well. Trevor emerged a moment later and raced over to me. Got it, he said. Without pausing to take the requisite pictures, he reached out and scooped me up into his arms. I squealed, batting my hand against his shoulder. Put me down. No way. His arm tightened, holding me securely. Your heel broke and this is the fastest way to get back. Just pretend you're part of my marathon training. You're insane. 
I laughed at the ridiculousness of the situation then gave in, looping my arms around his neck and trying to ignore how much I liked being cradled against his chest. We made it to the park in what felt like record time. He set me down on the pavement, and hand in hand we sprinted back to the fountain. Music blasted from speakers and we arrived to a chorus of cheers from the gathered crowd. Brandon Baker waved to us, holding a microphone. Congratulations Trevor Brooks and Mary and Nielsen. You're the winners of the Clue into Love Couples competition. I turned to Trevor, my eyes widening with surprise. No way. We did it! His face broke into a grin that matched the exhilaration rushing through every pore of my body. He stepped toward me. Thrilled for our victory, I jumped into his arms. Without thinking I pressed my lips against his. Heat rushed through my veins and I felt more alive than ever before. His mouth captured mine, strong and hard, making my legs turn weak. He held me tight like he never wanted to let me go. Then a rapid succession of clipped sounds flooded my ears, pulling me from my dreamy haze. I broke away, breathless, then turned to find a stream of photographers snapping pictures of us from every direction. Oh, well. I'd kissed Trevor for real. There was no way I could pretend that had been for the cameras because I hadn't even realized they were there. More importantly, I didn't care. From the look on Trevor's face, I could tell that he'd felt something in our kisses too. My mouth unexpectedly curved upward. Not only was it possible that I might win the show and get Grammy's bracelet back, but maybe I'd end up with Trevor too. Knowing this, I did what any girl in my situation would do, I kissed him again. Chapter 6 Soaring on my mass of happy emotions after yesterday's win, I got up and practically danced into work. With our victory, came the assurance that we were actual contenders to be the winning couple on Romance Revealed. The flare of hope that I'd been carrying with me since yesterday transitioned into complete optimism today. Despite stupid initial strikes I'd been drawn to Trevor since the first moment I'd laid eyes on him. Now it seemed that he actually liked me. Grammy always told me how she'd fallen for Grampy right away when they'd met waiting in line at a deli and she'd ordered a roast beef sandwich on rye. She'd told me I'd fall in love one day too. I'd thought I'd been in love with that awful Rick Mulroney in college, but that had been child's play compared to my feelings for Trevor. Plus Rick had turned out to be a total loser whereas Trevor was the exact opposite. He was sweet, thoughtful, generous, and so hot I could fry eggs on him. Well, if I cooked I could anyway. Good morning, Tara. I practically sang the words as I breezed toward my desk at work Thursday morning. Hi, Mary Ann. Tara glanced up and gave me a quick smile. She was our compliance specialist in charge of maintaining the integrity of this on-site property in accordance with our corporate office's policies and procedures. In a nutshell, she did her job, was pleasant to work with, and if she thought Elliot was a tweed then she was too busy to say anything. There was always something vaguely tense or spacey in her demeanor. Like the way she wore her hair up in a messy bun with a pencil or five stuck through it. The pencils weren't there as a cute fashion statement either. She had told me once that she used pencils often and sticking them in her hair was the only way she was sure she'd be able to find one. Quirky, but at least she did her work unlike a certain other person who had just looked up at me from his desk. Hi, Mary and Elliot said, then turned back to the magazine in his lap. Hello. I managed to get the word out through clenched teeth. My breathing grew shallow as I tensed. Elliot had been a pain since he'd started working here. And I felt helpless to do a thing about it. Elliot? Our boss, Elena, aka Elliot's aunt, came out of her office with a huge grin on her face. I didn't realize that you'd arrived yet. Come in here, won't you? I've got some exciting things to talk to you about. She smiled wider at us and looked directly at me. Isn't he the greatest? 
mmph, my face contorted and I knew what I'd mumbled was unintelligible but it was better than what I wanted to say. I busied myself shuffling through the papers in my inbox. We had several showings later this morning, and as the senior leasing consultant I knew I'd end up taking most of them. That was my specialty. I could sell our apartments like nothing else, and we hoped to be fully rented by the end of the month. Just as I was booting up my computer, the bell over the door jangled. I looked up and saw a young guy, probably one of the college students we rented to, standing next to Tara's desk. Can I help you? she asked in her distracted, slightly high-pitched voice. I'm Mark. I've got a problem in building too. Is maintenance around? he asked. Tara glanced over at me, asking a silent question with her eyes. Hi, Mark. I smiled warmly, hoping he wouldn't need something gross cleaned up right away. Sadly, college kids barfed on the premises more often than you'd imagine. Maintenance is off-site at our east side location this morning for a fire drill. Is there anything I can help you with? I asked. There's a cat on my balcony, he said. Okay, I was relieved that no vomit was involved, but wondered how a hairy feline was a big deal. Yeah, I'm not sure how it got there. But I really need to get it off, you know? Mark shifted from one foot to the other. I'm completely allergic. I mean, like break out in hives and run to the hospital type of thing. My nerves went on red alert. A medical problem with one of our residents would so not be a good thing. I could envision the insurance claims already. Yikes. Needed to nip this one in the bud pronto. I rose from my chair. Why don't you show me? He nodded fiddling with a leather bracelet on his wrist. I didn't think we were allowed to have pets. Are we allowed to have pets? Only with full disclosure and permission. I walked toward him, my heels clacking against the wooden floor. And a pet deposit. Who in the building has a cat, Tara? Would you look that up for me? She nodded. I'll get that info to you ASAP. Great, thanks. I opened the door, then followed Mark out the door and into the residence entrance. I live on the fourth floor. He gestured toward the stairs, even though it would have been nicer to take the elevator since I was in heels. Plus I was huffing by the third floor landing. I totally needed to go to the gym more. When we arrived at his apartment, he unlocked the door and stepped aside so I could enter. He lived in what we call the mansion because his balcony was double length and contained a hot tub with a privacy fence. Mansions tended to be party rooms, but I couldn't remember getting complaint calls about him. If I had to guess, I'd say Mr. Allergies didn't seem to be the drinking type either. I stepped gingerly through his rather messy apartment and opened the sliding glass door. Sure enough, there by the edge of the hot tub was a fluffy white cat with a bell around its neck. I sighed. How was this even remotely part of my job description? I'd leave the cat for maintenance or its owner, but it seemed to be stuck and I was afraid it might be hurt. Plus, the chance of Mark needing a trip to the emergency room seemed riskier than getting the cat. Then I saw that the cat was on the other side of the privacy fence. And we were on the fourth floor. And I was afraid of heights. Plus, why had I dressed in a short skirt and heels today of all days? From behind me there was a knock at the apartment door. I could hear voices from inside and a moment later Elliot appeared on the balcony. Great. As if the situation couldn't get any worse. Hey. He stepped toward me. Tara says that there are only two cats in this building, and a girl on the sixth floor reported hers missing yesterday, he told me as he leaned against the doorframe. Its name is White Russian. Why doesn't that surprise me? I sighed, suddenly longing for my days of lower pay at the corporate office. I peered over the side of the building, 
squinting in the sunlight. Then I glanced back down at the cat, which was out of Elliot's eye line since he hadn't bothered to come all the way outside. I may have been slightly paranoid, but I really felt like White Russian was pleading for help with the look in his eyes. Elliot checked his watch. Do you see it? Are you going to get it? I glanced over at Elliot, guessing he'd never pull out a chair for a girl like Trevor had for me. I'd even bet Trevor would rescue the cat. We can't leave him there or he might fall. So, yes. I'm going over and getting the cat. Don't let it die. Mark called from inside the apartment. He looked seriously concerned and then he pulled the collar of his shirt up over his mouth. Don't let any hair get in here either. My heart rate increased. Great. Not too much pressure. I will save you, white Russian. I took a deep breath, hiked my skirt up a little, then swung my foot over the railing. My heel caught, causing me to wobble, but I managed to get my leg over. My breath hitched and I gripped the railing. Then I did a very stupid thing and looked down at the ground, which was way too far below me. Gulp. Oddly, the cat hadn't moved. He just stared up at me curiously, his tail flicking back and forth. Now how was I going to get it out of here without taking it through the guy's apartment? Then an idea struck me and I shrugged off my jacket. Of course it was my black blazer, and now it would be covered with white cat hair. Because it was just that kind of a day. Holding my breath, I scooped up the cat and wrapped it in the jacket. Holding him tightly, I scrambled back over the railing, taking a moment to try and calm my racing heart. Wrapped completely inside my blazer, I cradled white Russian in my arms and glanced over at Elliot. Do you know which apartment the resident who lost her cat lives in? I think Tara said it was 6C, he stammered as he scrunched his face up. I'll go see if this belongs to her. I kept the jacket secured tightly around the cat as I hurried through Mark's apartment. When I was in the hallway, I let the kitty peek out. See? You're okay? Thank you so much. Mark peered from behind the door and the relief in his voice was evident. I'll tell all my friends about how awesome it is living here. Are there still apartments available? Definitely. I smiled, thinking a referral would be an amazing coup from this disaster. Just have your friends call the office for a showing. Right on, he said, then smiled at me. The girl on the sixth floor was thrilled to see her beloved white Russian, so I felt pretty good as I headed back down to the office. I had saved the cat. That was a pretty good day's work and I couldn't wait to text Trevor. When I reached the office door I could hear Elena's laughter floating through. And then I heard Elliot say, so I climbed over the balcony and scooped him up. The guy was so grateful he said he'd rave to all of his friends about our new apartment complex. We'll have this whole place rented out in a week. I had Mary and take the cat back up to the owner on the sixth floor. Great work, Elliot. You really saved the day. Elena's voice held pride. A cold chill rolled through me. He was taking credit for my work again. I wanted to run in there and tell my boss the truth, but Elliot's story sounded so believable even though I knew he was lying. What if she took his word over mine? Tears burned my eyes. I hurried to my desk, pulled open the drawer, and pulled my cell from my purse. All I wanted to do was call Trevor and hear his voice. I scrolled through my contacts and tapped on his number. Hey. It's, um, me. Hey, me, Trevor said with a teasing lilt in his voice. What's up? Can you meet me at Bernie's Bakery? I'm having the worst day ever and I could use a friend right now. Silence hung in the air and my stomach coiled. I was on the tip of retracting my request to apologize for even calling. What had I been thinking? We were just pretend dating. Then Trevor said, 
I'll be there in twenty minutes. Tingles ran through me and I felt better already. When I arrived at Bernie's bakery, windswept and out of breath, my gaze connected with Trevor's, and he was waiting for me at our table. He must have rushed over from his work to arrive so quickly. A wave of warmth washed over me. I was important enough to him that he'd drop whatever he'd been doing. I'm sorry for calling in the middle of your day. I dropped into the chair across from him. My gaze drifted to a plate on the table with biscotti, next to what I'd guess was a cup of mocha. My eyes watered. You ordered these for me? He gave me a side glance. Well, yeah. They're your favorites. That's so sweet. I bit my bottom lip, which trembled. I know you were probably really busy assessing risk or whatever, but thanks so much for coming. Of course I'd come. He reached across the table and took my hand in his. Now tell me what happened. Wait. I put my other hand to my forehead. Did I drag you from something important? I didn't even take that into consideration. I just called you. See, Ginger's right. I am impulsive. I'm glad you called. He gazed into my eyes and I could tell he meant his words. My client was very understanding. We rescheduled for tomorrow. Don't worry about me. I wanted to be here with you. A wave of warmth washed over me. Well, thanks. You're welcome. He released my hand and gestured toward the plate. Now eat your biscotti and tell me what happened. I couldn't help but smile a little as I lifted one of the delicious biscotti. Even though my stomach was in knots, I took a nibble then set it back down. There's this guy at my office who always takes credit for my work. As I described the situation to Trevor I felt tears prick my eyes, but I also felt a sense of relief that I'd confided in him. Talking to my sister or my friends resulted in advice. It felt amazing to have someone listen to me without judgment. When I was done explaining the horror of Elliot, I splayed my fingers on the table. I just don't know what to do about it. If I tell my boss, she might not believe me. But if I don't tell her this will keep happening. Trevor was silent for a long moment. You deserve so much better than this. I get why you don't want to go to your boss, though. It can be hard to confront the things that are happening at work. It's just. I mean. What right do I have to turn someone in when I've done something wrong, too? I basically eavesdropped both times. Plus I completely lied about Elliot being wonderful. What an awful lie. Trevor chuckled. I can't believe you saved a cat. You're a hero. I giggled. White Russian and his owner seemed to think so. His brows rose. White Russian. College kids. I laughed. Maybe she has another cat named Tequila? Or Vodka? Our laughter grew until we were both out of breath. Enough about me. I lifted my mocha and took a sip of its combined sugary bitterness. Delish. How do you think we'll do in the next challenge? He grinned. Pretty well, I think. We make a good team. I blushed. I knew that he was right. We did make a good team. It felt good, but impossibly scary to admit that to myself. I wanted to change the subject, but my mind felt like it had turned to sludge. Are you ever going to tell me why you're so generous with your charity donations? To founding friendships? Well, to be honest, he paused, taking a deep breath. Do you want to get out of here? Maybe we can take a walk. A walk sounds perfect. I downed the last of my mocha and stood. 
Then we ambled toward the exit together and I could feel Trevor's hand brushing my lower back as if he were guiding me. Together we stepped into the comfortable heat of the day. I pulled my sunglasses out of my purse and slipped them on. As we walked in companionable silence for a few blocks I realized that I had never been able to be with a guy like this before. Most of the time I was so focused on a guy's faults, his strikes, that I rushed to fill any silences with meaningless drivel. With Trevor it was different. Maybe it was because he'd gotten most of his strikes right up front, and ever since that point I had been erasing a few of those strikes because of his kindness. Or maybe it was just because Trevor was a different kind of guy. An amazing guy. I mulled that over as we crossed the street and stopped at a park. Trevor found a bench in the shade of a big oak tree not too far from a fountain. I dropped down beside him and he draped his arm along my back. So tell me about founding friendships, I said. He inhaled deeply. When I was a kid my dad lost his job. For a while we were okay. I think we must have had savings or something, but eventually it all ran out. We lost our house and ended up living out of our car for months. I gasped. I'm sorry. His jaw muscle tightened, but he went on. It was scary and humiliating losing our home, and to this day I still rent. But as a kid I couldn't put the loss into words. I just tried to keep my head down and avoid getting teased. We were always hungry and tired and dirty. I had to take sponge baths in the bathrooms of fast food restaurants. I can't believe that really happens, I admitted, shocked. Sure, I'd seen stuff on the news. But I'd never actually known someone who'd experienced being homeless. I reached for his hand. Trevor's fingers curled around mine and he closed his eyes, as if remembering. We finally found a bakery that would sell us day-old bread and pastries for dirt cheap. The guy who owned the place was friendly and he had kind eyes. One day I got up the guts to ask him for a job. He let my dad work at the bakery for a couple weeks and I had fun helping him. But it was obvious he didn't really need the help. Plus, he was going through a divorce at the time so he was short on money. A chill rolled through me. Something familiar about this story prickled my brain. It was obvious how torn up the owner was that he couldn't help more. But he got us a space at a homeless shelter so we didn't have to sleep in our car. And then my dad had an address to apply for jobs. That shelter literally saved our lives. So, yeah, I give back to charities. I owe so much to that baker for caring enough to find a shelter and connect us. Well. I breathed as he finished. He opened his eyes, and I could see the pain in them. Was the baker's name? Bernie. His gaze pierced mine. I heard he sold the bakery. That's true, I said, remembering the few times I'd met Melinda's stepdad, Bernie. He really did have kind eyes. He remarried recently, too. To my friend Melinda's mom. They were at the auction where I bought you. A strange expression flitted across his face. That's so, serendipitous. I nodded. Just like me finding my grandma's bracelet after all these years. That bracelet means a lot to you. His voice was low and soft, an unasked question lingering there. Somewhere in my head I could hear my grandmother whispering to trust him. To finally let out what I'd been holding in since I was seven years old. Gazing into his eyes there was no pressure, no judgment, just concern. My stomach bubbled as I sucked in a breath. When I was seven my Grammy moved in with us. My dad was an ER doctor. He had a hard time dealing with losing patients and started drinking pretty heavily. Those were hard times. I know now that he was in pain, but back then all I knew was to stay away from daddy when he was drunk. A breeze blew across the park, moving some blonde strands across my line of vision, and Trevor brushed them back gently, tucking them behind my ear. 
When my dad drank, he'd scream and yell at my mom and my sister and me. Sometimes he'd throw things. He ended up losing his job. Hey, I guess we have that in common, huh? That must have been awful, he said, stroking my hand with his thumb. It got worse after my grandma passed away. A bunch of bills piled up so my mom sold Grammy's bracelet. And it had been so special to me, my voice drifted off, and a dark blanket tightened around me as I was brought back to my childhood and that day. Tears burned my eyes. I could hear Grammy's reassuring words like an echo, that with the bracelet I could be brave and strong. My lips felt numb as I fought to form words. My dad had scolded me for bouncing on my pogo stick inside the house. I'd broken my mom's favorite vase and he'd screamed at me, warned me to never use the pogo stick in the house again. I closed my eyes, hearing his shouts in my mind, and my shoulder blades pulled together. A bird squawked, the sound ringing across the park bringing me back to the here and now. And to Trevor. I opened my mouth again. My dad's friend, his drinking buddy, had been over the next week. My dad went to the garage for more scotch. I shuddered, remembering what happened next. I'd been bouncing on my pogo stick outside and came inside the house for a glass of water. I bounced through the living room and bumped into my dad's friend's beer and knocked it over. He lost his temper. Before I knew it, he'd shoved his palms into my chest, knocking me across the room until I hit the fireplace. Trevor made a quiet noise beside me and I looked up to see his jaw tighten, the muscles pulsing. Did you report him? I shook my head, numbly. All I could think was that I shouldn't have disobeyed my dad. If I told anyone then my dad would know I disobeyed him and I'd be in trouble. Maybe he'd tell me I deserved what I got. Did your dad ever hit you? I shook my head, hot tears escaping down my face. No, but he'd yell and it would make me afraid. I couldn't tell him or anyone. Oh, baby. Suddenly, Trevor's arms were around me and he pulled me against his chest. I buried my head there, inhaling the outdoors ascent of pine that smelled like him. The tears fell for minutes that felt like hours. When I was done, a heavy weight lifted off my shoulders. I sniffled. I hope I'm not getting snot on your shirt. His chest vibrated against my cheek as he chuckled. How do you think of such things? Compulsive about keeping clothes clean? I suggested with a giggle. After it happened, after he pushed me, I ran to Grammy's room for comfort. I went to her after I starting having nightmares, too. She had this special bracelet she always wore and she clasped it around my wrist. She told me as long as I wore that bracelet then nothing could hurt me. I believed her. Trevor was silent for a while. Then he said, you don't need your grandma's bracelet to be brave, Muffin. You can do that all on your own. I don't know that. I do. He brushed his mouth over the top of my head. I'm sure Grammy believed in you, too. She just used the bracelet as a reason for you to believe in yourself. I get it, though. I really am sorry for the way I behaved when I first found out that's what you wanted to do with your money. I shook my head, swallowing the tears that remained. You couldn't have known. I really can be a bit stuffy, huh? A burst of laughter escaped. Don't make me bring up the police report again. I've finally put that behind us. He chuckled, placing his finger under my chin and lifting my gaze. When I looked up at Trevor, there was such intensity in his gaze that it stole my breath. You are stronger than you think, he murmured. He angled his head closer to me, and his gaze searched mine. I leaned nearer, knowing what he wanted, and wanting it too. His mouth brushed mine in the lightest butterfly touch. I responded instantly, weaving my fingers through his soft hair and kissing him back. 
I loved the feeling of his mouth on mine. When he deepened the kiss, fire shot through my belly and I tasted him over and over, never getting enough and still trying for more. When we finally broke apart, he wrapped his arms around me and rested his chin on the top of my head. I had a hard time staying still, in the moment, because my flight or fight instincts told me to run. That he'd hurt me just like Rick had back in college when he cheated on me. But my heart had already bypassed my head. Chapter 7 By the time I got back to the office, I hadn't worked even half an hour before it was time for lunch. I gathered my keys and purse from my desk drawer while Elliot was trying to convince Tara to have lunch with him. She claimed she wanted to work through her break but now she seemed to be considering his lunch invitation. Did Elliot like Tara in a lunch date turns into dinner turns into a romantic weekend in Tahoe? Way? The thought took the word ick to a heightened level for me. The two were polar opposites motivationally speaking and I could already see him letting her do the dishes and the laundry while he watched a football game with his feet propped on the coffee table she just cleaned. Ugh. Now I was projecting. The more time I spent with Trevor, the worse I felt about not standing up to Elliot and not telling my boss about his false claim to my work. Watching Elliot trying to woo Tara made me nauseated, so getting out of here to grab a bite to eat was a must before I lost my appetite completely. In order to avoid the office longer, I drove to my favorite sandwich shop downtown and Trevor's kisses replayed in my brain. Best smooches of my life, hands down. My feelings for Trevor were sending me into a tailspin, but I'd let him in and now I was blissfully happy like a schoolgirl with her first crush. I arrived at the sandwich shop, placed my order, and decided I'd head down to the concrete park with the gold miner statue to eat because the day was just so beautiful. I also wanted to reminisce over the kiss Trevor and I had shared there after we'd won the scavenger hunt. Just as I stepped out the door, I caught sight of the man in question across the street coming out of a restaurant. My belly fluttered at the sight of him and I opened my mouth to call out his name when a woman I immediately recognized stepped out in front of him as he held the door open for her. It was Wendy Watts from Romance Revealed. I gasped audibly, watching them in shock. Trevor turned to Wendy with the same smile he had given me dozens of times and I ducked back into the sandwich shop so they wouldn't see me. My mind started spinning. He'd acted like he'd liked me not two hours ago and now he was having lunch with our competition? What was going on? I peered through the window as he walked down the block with her. They stopped in front of a white Mercedes SUV, which I assumed was her car since I knew from my insurance representative that his was still in the shop. Also, I really didn't see him forking out money for a second car let alone an expensive car when he could be donating that money to charity or whatever. But what did I really know about him anyway? I certainly hadn't thought he'd move on to the next girl by lunchtime. My fists balled as he placed his hand on the small of her back. How could I have been so stupid? I dismissed my one strike hand you out rule and let him play me. If I had kept my guard up like I normally did, then I would have stood by his strikes and would never have let myself get close to him. But I had let him get close and my heart squeezed in my chest to prove it. Wendy Watts with her confident smile and her sleek, dark hair cut stylishly beneath her chin. She was known as the queen of realtors around Sacramento, and her realtor photo appeared on many billboards across the city. She was like the perfect woman and I'm sure there was no way she'd let a guy take credit for her work. I watched her move graciously in an obviously expensive navy blue pants suit, which made her look impossibly elegant. Trevor still wore the suit he had on earlier and the two of them made a good-looking pair. She was just the right height to compliment him and the way he leaned in as he spoke to her had my stomach coiling. Trevor opened the driver's side door for her, then he walked in the opposite direction with a stupid smile plastered on his face. At least he hadn't kissed her before he got in on the passenger side. That would have been too much for me to handle. When they drove away I slipped out of the shop, unsure about what to do next. No longer hungry, I dropped my sandwich into my purse and started to walk aimlessly through downtown. 
There was no way I could go back to the office yet to face Elliot. Somehow I ended up in the concrete park. As I sank down on the edge of the minor statue, I felt tears burning behind my eyes but I refused to cry. I needed to talk to someone. Briefly I considered calling my sister, but I knew Ginger would just give me a lecture of some sort. I decided to call Melinda. You are never going to believe this. My voice was raw and tight. You sound upset. What's going on? Melinda asked, her voice laced with concern. Trevor Brooks has been dating our competition the whole time behind my back. I just saw him on a lunch date with Wendy. I'm confused. Melinda paused a moment and I heard voices in the background. Avery said she saw you with Trevor earlier, here at the bakery. Sorry I missed you, but I was making a delivery. Huh. I hadn't seen Melinda's barista and our friend Avery at Bernie's bakery. Yes, we were there. He kissed me. Multiple times. But now I just saw him with Wendy what's getting into her car. Have you talked to him? Melinda asked. I puckered my face into a pout. I'm not going to humiliate myself like that after what I saw. This is like a whole season's worth of strikes and I don't even like baseball. Take a deep breath. Her voice was calm, which annoyed me. She should be rushing to my defense and confirming what a snake Trevor turned out to be. Don't get mad at me for suggesting this, but it seems to me like you might be jumping to conclusions before you have all of the information. What? I pulled myself from my ear, stared at it, then considered throwing it at the statue. I couldn't afford to buy a new phone with my credit card maxed out, though. Sigh. You have the perfect boyfriend, the perfect career, and you've forgotten what it's like to be single with a sucky job. Sweetie, I'm on your side. I just don't want you to make a mistake based on circumstantial evidence. Did she think she was a freaking lawyer now? Well, this jury was so out. Look. I sucked in a deep breath, glaring at the bronze miner with his pick, who seemed to be staring at me with a knowing look. Thanks for listening, but I need to get back to work. We filmed the third competition tonight and I need to come up with a game plan before then. I'll talk to you later. My heart ached as I hung up and headed back to the office. I felt colossally stupid. How had I not noticed this coming? I tried to recall Trevor showing interest in Wendy during filming, but came up blank. Surely there had been clues that I had missed because I had been so smitten. Then I remembered him paying close attention to her after the auction. Duh. I was beyond dense. Tonight was going to be an epic challenge. I still needed to look like I was falling in love with Trevor so we could win. We both needed that money. Even if I was furious with him, that didn't mean I couldn't support his cause and I was going to get Grammy's bracelet back. No matter what I had to do. This would take a lot of acting, but if it meant I'd get her bracelet back, then I'd do everything I could. Along with the two other remaining couples Trevor and I entered the ballroom of the Victorian house in downtown Sacramento where we'd be filming the third segment of Romance Revealed. I gazed around the room, which had the gilded trim of that era, and a polished parquet floor that shined as we walked to the contestant side of the room. I could imagine the elegant parties that had been thrown in here once upon a time and the prospective spectacle that was about to take place. Around the edges of the room a smattering of chairs with high backs and deep red velvet seats had been artfully arranged. In the corner of the room a three-piece orchestra had set up, and I felt nerves flutter in my stomach. It was the perfect romantic setting, but sadly I had no romance to reveal tonight. I'd gone over Trevor's lunch date with Wendy thousands of times in my head, trying to come up with an innocent reason why the two would be leaving in a car together. I came up with Zilch. I needed to face the facts. I'd fallen hard for Trevor and he hadn't fallen for me in the same way. 
Maybe his dedication to win for charity had made him purposefully deceive me, but deep down I didn't believe that. I fidgeted in my evening gown which Ginger and Melinda had helped me pick out. The gorgeous dress was long and blue with a fitted bodice and a sweep of faux diamonds down the skirt. It fit like a glove and the makeup girl kept telling me that I looked really pretty. Not beautiful, gorgeous, or stunning. Just really pretty. I'd bet money she'd say Wendy looked spectacular tonight since she always did. Mike and Maggie had been eliminated after the Clue into Love competition, which left Chase and Wendy, Ross and Evie, and Trevor and me, with our pretend relationship. Not knowing what our challenge would be made me nervous. I'd run in heels during our last competition and that hadn't turned out well. The only upside had been Trevor carrying me to the finish line and there was zero chance of that happening if my heel broke this time around. Welcome, contestants. Brandon Baker strode to the center of the ballroom. Sit tight a few moments while we wrap up last-minute details. Then we'll begin the ballroom dancing couples competition, called Love and Romance. Love and Romance? Ha. More like date and dash. Because I was so etching my one-strike hand you out dating policy in granite after this debacle with Trevor Brooks. I smoothed my hands over my dress again as Trevor turned to me. His eyes lit up and he smiled in a way that nearly broke my heart. He dropped a kiss on my cheek. I have to say it again. You look amazingly beautiful. Confusion rocketed through me as he put his hand on the small of my back to guide me through the maze of production equipment. If he had a thing going with Wendy, then why was he acting like he had feelings for me? Oh, right. Cameras were all around us. It had to be an act for the competition. At least if I was buying it right now then the viewers would too, which would help us win. Yay, us. How do you think our chances are tonight? Trevor asked with a twinkle in his eye. Do you know how to dance? Huh? Oh, yeah, like club dancing. I kept an eye on Wendy out of the corner of my eye. She was straightening Chase's tie, and I wondered if he knew about her lunch date with Trevor this afternoon or if he'd been duped like I'd been. Unfortunately, I have two left feet. Trevor chuckled, the corners of his eyes crinkling in an adorable way that I didn't want to find appealing. I've seen some of those Jane Austen movies where they waltz or whatever. How hard can it be? We're going to rock it. I watched his face light up in one of his grins that still made me feel wobbly, but I forced my gaze across the room to Wendy. He touched my elbow, and I glanced up at him. When his gaze locked on mine I knew I couldn't just unfall for him. If only. Sure. Yeah, we'll rock it. My breath hitched in my chest and I gave him a forced smile that nearly split my face in half. He slipped his arm around my waist and pulled me close. Want to practice? I saw Wendy and Chase begin to practice, which was probably where he'd gotten the idea, from watching Wendy, the girl he really liked. Yes, I suppose we should practice, I mumbled, listlessly. I tried to mimic the way Wendy held her arms stiffly as Chase led her around the room. One, two, three, four, I murmured as I watched the couple spin across the floor. On the other side of the room, Evie and Ross were talking with their heads bent together. I saw Ross point to us then to Wendy and Chase, and I frowned remembering the first competition and the bullet that had been shot suspiciously early. Something was off about those two and I wondered what they had up their sleeves this time. Ouch. Trevor flinched as I stepped on his toe, then he raised his brows at me. Everything okay tonight, Mary Ann? Peachy, hot stuff. I tossed my blonde curls over my shoulder, hoping that he'd ignore the edge in my voice and would accept the answer at face value. I just really want to win. You know that. Okay. Just checking. I almost felt bad for being so quick to jump down his throat but then I remembered the way he looked at Wendy before they disappeared inside her expensive SUV. 
So, how do you think Wendy looks tonight? Wendy? He shrugged. She looks fine, I guess. Just fine? Not gorgeous? I asked, unable to stop the bitterness from spewing out of my mouth. She and Chase are pretty good dancers, Trevor replied. Apparently he didn't notice that I was trying to out him. That or he was just a really good actor. His forehead wrinkled and he gave me a side glance before he twirled me. Why the sudden questions about Wendy? You think they're bigger competition than Ross and Evie? Maybe. I just really want to win so I can get my Grammy's bracelet, I said, feeling like a broken record. Maybe with the bracelet, I'd feel strong again and find a way to stand up to Elliot. Now I also needed her bracelet to get through the heartbreak of Trevor hooking up with Wendy after the competition ended because that was obviously where it was heading. So depressing. Ginger never understood my weaknesses. Trevor wouldn't get them either. He had been strong when his life circumstances dictated for him to be. But I'd needed the bracelet to feel strong and secure. Super pathetic. Couples, we're starting our next couples competition, Love and Romance. Brandon Baker announced clapping his hands above his head. I rolled my eyes. Blah and black. Our host's smile beamed above his microphone. Each couple will be judged on the way they dance together. It's all about chemistry and also how well you couples can handle outside instruction in your relationship. I blew my bangs up. Little did he know that outside influences on my relationship were exactly my problem. There will be an instructor who will demonstrate a variety of dances, and then you'll have a few minutes to practice before the judging starts. After each round, you'll be given a score. The couple with the lowest total score of the night will be eliminated. Ready, set, dance. At first the dances were kicking my booty. The rumba made my brain spin, but Trevor was a quick study, and he led beautifully. Evie and Ross looked like professionals, I murmured as we ended the first dance. Sweat was dripping down my back, making me feel as sexy as a gorilla, but Trevor didn't seem to notice. Wendy and Chase are pretty good too, Trevor said. My heart squeezed. So he was paying attention to her. It hadn't just been my imagination. I pushed the heartbreak aside, reminding myself to focus on the task at hand, winning. By the time we got to the waltz, I felt like I was finally getting my groove on. I knew that Trevor wanted to win just as much as I did, so we were both concentrating on our dance moves quietly. We didn't talk, but there was a certain sense of camaraderie that we shared and we made a good team. The judging will now begin for love and romance. Brandon Baker's voice came over the speakers above the music. As we started officially dancing for the competition, I vowed that I would throw everything into this dance. Now was our chance to impress the judges right from the start. Trevor spun me around. Adrenaline pumped through me and I did a spur-of-the-moment fancy leap as I came back to him, which had so not been a good idea. A sharp jolt sliced my ankle as I landed, my ankle turning in a way that no ankle should ever go. I cried out in pain, losing my balance, but Trevor steadied me in his arms. Are you okay? he asked, concern evident in his tone. I'm fine. My teeth were clenched as pain radiated up my leg. Let's just keep going. We need to win. He looked at me doubtfully but said, okay, if you're sure. As he turned me for a spin, pain exploded everywhere, sending stars dancing in my peripheral vision. I stifled a squeal. See? I'm fine, I said through gritted teeth. Trevor stopped in his tracks, then suddenly lifted me up into his arms. He walked me over to one of the velvet chairs as the orchestra continued to play. Gently he eased me onto the seat, then he crouched down and slipped the heel off my foot. With gentle fingers he probed my ankle. The touch of his skin against mine sent shivers skittering up my leg. 
I swallowed hard. He looked up at me with regret. Your ankle's starting to swell. Maybe a medic can wrap it all supportive or whatever and then we can get back in there. My words spilled over each other as my heart raced. We'll lose points if we aren't dancing and we have to win. For Grammy's bracelet. For your charity. It's not worth it if you're hurt. His voice was low and firm. The swelling's growing, Muffin. I'm sorry, but I need to take you to the emergency room. I wanted to protest, but the pain was getting too intense. I could barely breathe at the moment. Fine, I said shakily. Let's go. Hold up a minute, Trevor said. You can't walk on that. It'll only make it worse. Before I knew what was happening, Trevor scooped me up into his arms and cradled me gently against his chest. It was so heroic the way he took charge. The realization that I had fallen for him hard and fast settled over me as Trevor quickly explained the situation to the approaching medic. Then he carried me out of the ballroom. As we walked outside toward Trevor's rental car, my throat tightened. We couldn't finish the competition so we'd have the lowest points for sure. And we'd been so close to winning. I wanted to kick myself for trying to show off. My impulsiveness had struck again. But this time it hadn't just ruined things for me, but for Trevor too. Chapter 8 I slumped into work the next morning. Never before had I felt so low. Losing the competition was bad enough, but losing Trevor felt even worse. Oh, yeah. I also had a sprained ankle to boot. Trevor had been sweet taking me to the doctor but all I could think about in the emergency room was him with Wendy. He'd noticed something was up because he'd asked several times if anything was wrong, but I'd just voiced some noncommittal response each time. I'd asked him casually what he'd done for lunch and he'd looked me in the eye and told me errands. That had been the perfect opportunity for him to mention his lunch with Wendy if it really had been casual, but he hadn't. Tara was on the phone when I walked into the office. I gave her what I hoped was a halfway decent smile, then I headed to my desk. Setting my lunch bag down, I wished the day was already over and I could crawl into bed. Eight more hours and counting. Oh, Mary Ann. Tara hung up the phone then scurried over to my desk carrying a local newspaper in her hand. She pointed to a large photo on the front page. Look, it's you. The article says you're going to be on a reality TV special called Romance Revealed next week. Is that true? Who's the hot guy you're dating? Tara's litany of questions broke me out of my negative spiral of thoughts and I glanced down at the photo of all five of us couples in front of the gold miner statue downtown. My gaze dropped to where Trevor's arm draped around my shoulder. We tilted our heads together, smiling proudly as if we belonged together. Fat chance. A stab of pain speared my chest and I grimaced. I'm not dating him for real. It's all pretend. He's seeing someone else anyway. The show is just for fun, you know? Her face fell, but she recovered quickly. Well, I want to watch it anyway. I mean, how often do you actually know a celebrity? I couldn't help but smile. Probably less often in Northern California than if you lived in Hollywood. But I'm not a celebrity. Well you're on the cover of a newspaper. Pretty cool stuff, she said, then headed back toward her desk. Just as she was leaving my cell phone vibrated. I pulled it out of my jacket pocket and pressed the green button to answer the call. Hello? Mary Ann? This is Theodore Rollins. I sighed. Theodore Rollins was the producer of Romance Revealed. When would this nightmare of reality TV end? Did they really have to officially call me to boot me off the show? It's a no-brainer that we'd been eliminated. What can I do for you, Mr. Rollins? 
Well, you might have guessed that you and Trevor received the lowest score from the judges at the Love and Romance Couples competition. His deep voice sounded matter-of-fact with no hint of sympathy. So cold, but whatever. Well, we've had a new twist to the show. As it turns out Evie and Ross have been cheating throughout the competitions. We caught them in the act last night and reviewed tape from the previous episodes. They've been disqualified as a result, which means you and Trevor are back in the competition. Chills vibrated through me and I clutched the edge of my desk. We were in again? That meant that we could still win. Does Trevor know? I'm calling him next. We'll see you tonight. Thank you so much. I hung up and leaned back in my chair. I should be excited that we were back in the running, but losing Trevor had made me spiral so far into my pit of sadness that it was hard to climb back out. How had I not realized how great Trevor was right from the beginning? So he was a bit uptight when it came to insurance claims. His home runs certainly outweighed his strikes. Besides, I really needed to stop thinking about guys in terms of baseball metaphors because I didn't even like sports. I rubbed my eyes with the heels of my hands. Images of Trevor flickered through my head like a movie gone wrong. In hindsight all the evidence was there that Trevor was potentially the perfect guy for me. My ankle throbbed slightly as if to remind me of how many mistakes I'd made with him. Marianne, can you come into my office for a moment? Elena called from down the hall. My stomach clenched. I hoped she wasn't upset about my extended break yesterday morning when I'd met Trevor at Bernie's Bakery. She was usually flexible since she knew I often stayed late at the office and worked through breaks more times than not. I trudged down to her office. What's up, Elena? I asked, infusing my voice with as much enthusiasm as I could. Have a seat. Elena shut the door behind me then went back to her desk. After I sat down, she gave me a serious look. I wanted to let you know that I'm being transferred to another location. It's a promotion. Congratulations, I said, relieved that I wasn't busted for anything. How cool that she was being promoted at another location. Wait a minute. If she was leaving this location then that left her current position available. A buzz of excitement fluttered in my stomach. Could this mean what I hoped it meant? She laced her hands on the desk in front of her and leaned forward. You're the assistant community director. I know you've been with NGN Properties a long time and we really value your work. So I wanted you to hear it from me first. She paused a moment, giving me an unreadable look. I'm promoting Elliot to community director when I leave. The buzzing in my ears grew louder ending with an explosion as hope shattered all around me. You're promoting Elliot ahead of me? I know you've been here longer than he has, but you mentioned you work well with him so I hope this will be a smooth transition. She nodded as if to agree with her annoying little speech. As you've told me yourself, he's doing an outstanding job. He's also shown such initiative and creativity over the past few weeks that I know this is the right decision. I understand completely. I sucked in my breath and hoped that the tears in my eyes would hold until I could get out of her office. I couldn't let Elena see me cry. When I put my hand on the door to leave, I paused. Trevor's story about how he had taken his fate into his own hands when he was just a kid ran through my mind. He'd sounded so sure at the park yesterday when he told me that I didn't need Grammy's bracelet to be brave. I hadn't believed him. But what if he was right? Taking a deep breath, I turned around. Actually, Elena? There is something I should have told you already. Elliot didn't do any of those things that you think are so creative and great. I did and he took credit for my work. A frown puckered her face. I know that you're disappointed. But you shouldn't damage Elliot's reputation just because of that. 
I'm telling the truth. I swallowed, feeling the despair rise up. Thinking of Trevor buoyed my spirit, though. Elliot says he put together the neighborhood watch program but I did that. And how he claimed to have rescued the cat. That was me again. In heels and a super short skirt to boot. She gazed at me skeptically. All Elliot did was come upstairs to give me a message from Tara about who owned the cat. I'm the one who climbed over the balcony railing to reach the cat, then I had to wrap my black blazer around him so none of its white hair would fall in the apartment because the tenant who reported the cat on his balcony was freaking allergic. Her mouth fell open a little. I'll be honest, Mary Ann. I'm really floored by this. Maybe you should take some time and rethink things. I shook my head adamantly. There was no way I was backing down now. Ask Elliot. Ask him how he got the cat out of the apartment without poor allergic Mark needing a trip to the emergency room. I wrapped it in my black jacket, which is still at the cleaners by the way. He never even saw the cat so ask him what color he is, because he's white and fluffy like a giant puffball. His name is White Russian. You can call the girl in 6C to confirm. When I stopped talking I saw that Elena's frown had deepened, but she pressed the intercom and asked Elliot to come to her office. Moments later he arrived smiling all bright and cheery and she said, Elliot, I was trying to remember what you told me about that cat you rescued from the balcony. What color was the cat again? Elliot's face paled and he looked from me to Elena. Finally he said, oh, well, it was black. Yeah, black as night. Probably unlucky, you know? Elena nodded. Thank you both. I'll talk to you later. He gave me a nervous look as we left Elena's office, and I guessed that she was going to call the tenant in 6 C to confirm our stories. It still irritated me that she would believe him over me, but I knew I had to let it go. He was her nephew so of course she felt inclined to believe him. I sat and stared at my computer, unable to get any work done until I saw Elena come out of her office. I watched as she walked over to Elliot and talked to him softly. They retreated into her office then the door shut. When he came out his face was as white as a sheet and I realized that she must have confirmed my side of the story. Then he started packing his things and I wondered if she'd fired him. Mary Ann, can you come in here for a moment? Elena called. I took a deep breath and braced myself for whatever was in store next. I mean, I was just telling the truth so she shouldn't kill the messenger. When I went back to her office and sat down again, I saw her face pucker and she looked apologetic. Mary Ann. She pressed her fingers against her temples. I'm so sorry for not believing you when you first told me. You've always been honest and that was unprofessional of me. I just have to ask, why didn't you ever say anything before? Well, I thought it was more important to get the work done and not worry about who got credit for it, I said slowly, realizing that was how it had started out. Then I'd praised Elliot because he was your nephew and I wanted to make you happy. But I should have been straight with you. You had good intentions, though, which I appreciate. Elena's smile stretched across her whole face. That's exactly the kind of loyalty to the company we are looking for at NGN Properties and at this apartment complex. So. I'd like to offer you this position of community director. You may take the evening to think about it and give me your answer tomorrow. All right, I will. I smiled, even though I already knew what my answer would be. I mean, hello? Big pay raise and I had a maxed out credit card that needed attention. My mood lifted as I went back to work. I looked over my shoulder and Elliot and his belongings were all gone. I had stood up for myself. The safe and secure feeling I'd known as a child suddenly enveloped me, only this time I wasn't wearing the bracelet. I'd been brave all on my own. 
What if I could be brave in other aspects of my life as well? Melinda told me I should ask Trevor about Wendy but I'd been too scared to do that. I needed to be brave, to confront Trevor tonight at the final competition, and find out for sure if he really did like Wendy or if maybe we still had a chance. In the back of my mind I heard Grammy saying she was proud of me. When I arrived at the studio, I was rushed into makeup and hair before I'd had a chance to see Trevor. My nerves were jumping as the gal touched up my blonde curls, giving my hair new fullness I wished I could achieve at home. I knew Trevor was in the green room down the hall because I'd asked. Despite all my misgivings, I was going to tell him how I truly felt about him and why I'd been so distant. Lay all my cards on the table. Taking a deep breath I swung the door open just in time to see Wendy throw her arms around Trevor's neck. My heart dropped into my stomach as I stared at them in disbelief. I am so glad we met on this show, she said, squeezing him hard. Trevor gazed down at her with a huge smile on his face. My parents are going to be so excited. What? He's introducing her to his parents already? I'd just been hoping to declare I was head over heels for him. I hadn't even thought that far ahead. Maybe they could have a special romance revealed episode of them picking out their china pattern soon. The thought made me want to throw up. Ugh. I'd wanted to declare my feelings to Trevor but what would be the point now? I cleared my throat. The only thing more humiliating than witnessing this little love fest was being caught eavesdropping, and my new motto was to be brave. They both turned my way, looking startled at getting caught. Wendy glanced up at Trevor with a small frown and seemed to be asking him something. He shook his head in answer. What did that little exchange mean? He looked so excited, too. Everything in me hurt at that moment. I knew that if I was a better person I'd be happy for him that he'd found someone to love. But that wasn't how I felt. I wanted him for myself. He released Wendy and stepped toward me. I'm glad I caught you before the show, Mary Ann. I have something to talk to you about. I'll give you both some space. Wendy tilted her head, giving me a smile that said she knew something I didn't. This was suddenly way too much. I put my hands over my ears. I didn't want to hear what Trevor had to say because I knew from his grin what that was. He was going to tell me he'd fallen for Wendy and that they were going to make a life together. I wanted to scream that I wanted him to introduce me to his parents, but obviously our phony relationship wasn't enough for him. I wasn't enough. You'll never guess what. Can we talk about it later? I interrupted with a curt voice. I just want to focus on the competition right now. Get my head back in the game, you know. The smile on Trevor's face wavered. Actually it's important and will only take a minute. Only 60 seconds to break my heart. Talk about succinct. I admired his persistence, but there was no way I could win the show with my heart completely shattered. As it stood now it would be hard to focus with my heart crumpled up and tossed aside. I stepped back, shaking my head. We have to win this competition. This is our second chance and we can't blow it. We need to put on the best act we can for those cameras. Just like we planned to all along. An act? Trevor sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose. What are you talking about? You're making us look like we're arguing, I said through a fake smile in case people or cameras were watching. His brows came together. That is my fault? What did I do wrong? Nothing. I shook my head and tried for an appeasing expression. Let's just stick to our plan, look like we have a deep connection, blah 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 in case they start filming us. Okay, honey bunch? His eyes narrowed. That's hot stuff to you. Whatever. I threw my hand in the air completely annoyed that he was being a child about this. 
I was the one being a bigger person here while he dumped me for the competition. Did I need to hear his feelings for Wendy expressed in detail before our last televised couples competition? Uh, that would be a no. Trevor opened his mouth to say something else when Brandon Baker called us all over. Five minutes until show time, couples. Take your places. We're talking after the show. Trevor's eyes were heated and he used a tone that said there was no turning him down. Whatever, I said. Right now we just need to win. As we walked into the game room, Trevor put his hand on the small of my back. I wanted to sink into his touch, and I let myself. I could admit this time that it wasn't for the cameras but because it was our last time to be together. There will be no eliminations tonight, everyone. Brandon Baker's face lit up as he winked at us. This final film segment is called The Truth and Love. Your job, Trevor and Mary Ann, and Chase and Wendy, is to woo the live audience tonight. For our final segment in the next episode, the audience will watch all of the previous couples' competitions then they'll vote on the winners to reveal which couple they believe is most compatible and most in love. The winning couple will be announced on live TV. Trevor dropped his arm from around me as we took our seats and the tension between us was palpable. Even if he did have a thing with someone else, we still had to fake our love so we could win the competition. After losing Trevor, Grammy's bracelet suddenly seemed like a consolation prize. Ginger had been right that an heirloom was not a loved one. At some point, Trevor had become more important than winning. Think about the truth in love as a quiz show. Brandon Baker's voice boomed in front of us but he hadn't turned on his microphone yet because the live audience had only just arrived to watch us. You submitted your answers separately an hour ago and your partner will be tested on his or her knowledge of you. Here we go. Music started and the stage flooded with lights revealing our two sets of chairs facing each other. Trevor and I sat on one side while Wendy and Chase sat on the other. Tonight we were filming in front of a live audience and I wanted to attribute the butterflies in my stomach to that. I knew the real reason for my nerves, though, was the thought of Trevor's rejection confession that was coming later. Welcome, audience. Brandon Baker held his arm out to the audience and a burst of applause filled the room. Tonight we are filming the truth in love before you ladies and gentlemen. You're going to find out how well our bachelors and their dates have gotten to know each other over the course of this competition. Thinking of all I'd learned about Trevor in just a week, I wondered how my life had gotten so complicated in such a short time. Each couple has answered five questions, and we'll have to guess what their partner answered. Shall we get started? Brandon pulled out a red heart-shaped card and the audience cheered. All right then, the first question we asked was how does your partner take their coffee? We'll start with Wendy and Chase. Wendy likes her French roast black, Chase said, grinning in her direction. Poor schmuck didn't even know he was about to get his heart broken. And Chase likes his fair trade organic roast with a shot of vanilla. Wendy grinned back at him. Man, she was a really good actress. If I hadn't known about her and Trevor, I would have thought she really did have a thing for Chase. Brandon Baker waved his hand in my direction. Trevor and Mary Ann? Mary Ann loves mochas and she soaks her favorite biscottis from Bernie's Bakery in East Sacramento in her mocha until they become soft. I blinked at Trevor in surprise. I hadn't realized that he'd been paying attention. Obviously he was taking this competition way more seriously than I had anticipated. And I realized that I had no idea how he took his coffee. Um, I stammered as I tried to come up with an answer. All eyes were on me but I hadn't seen a coffee in front of him at the bakery. He, um, doesn't like coffee. So that's a trick question for us? Correct. Brandon Baker called out delightedly as a bell dinged. Everyone got those correct. Good job, contestants. Let's move on. 
The audience clapped appreciatively, and even though I couldn't see them beyond the stage lights, I could feel their energy and it made me nervous. Brandon Baker brought his microphone up again. What is your partner's favorite childhood memory? I saw Chase and Wendy glance at each other, and then Chase said, Wendy loved living at her grandmother's inn on the beach of Blue Moon Bay. And Chase loved going to his grandpa's farm, Wendy chimed in. Correct, Brandon Baker said, and the audience responded with lackluster applause. I agreed. Their responses were clearly rehearsed. I was so lost in thought that I jumped when Brandon Baker said, Mary Ann? Huh? Oh, um, well, I believe that Trevor's favorite memories of his childhood center around spending time with his family, but especially when his dad got a job at a bakery, and he got to help, I said, glancing sideways at Trevor. He gave me a bittersweet smile and nodded slightly. And Mary and loved it when her grandmother let her wear a very special bracelet. Those answers are correct, Brandon Baker said. It seems like you two really have spent some time getting to know what's important to each other. Ah. The audience cooed, and I blushed. Knowing how well Trevor had listened to me made it even more heartbreaking that he had fallen for Wendy. What does your partner do for a living? And why? We're realtors. Chase and Wendy declared at the same time. Then Wendy added, and we do it because our mission in life is to find you the perfect home. The audience giggled and groaned, and I had to fight to keep from rolling my eyes. Trevor is in risk management, I said. And he does it because he knows the value of keeping the people you love safe. Mary Ann is in property management. Trevor paused and looked me in the eye. This is the perfect job for her because she's friendly, reaches out to people easily, and is eager to help solve their problems. She's kind-hearted that way and she even saved a cat this week. Mary Ann. Mary Ann. The audience shouted my name over and over as if at a football game. He was a sweet cat. I called back, waving at the audience. Trevor leaned over and gave me a kiss right there on stage. Flutters took up residence in my belly, but I knew he'd only done it for the win. A knot formed in my stomach as I realized how differently this whole thing could have gone if I hadn't pushed Trevor away in the beginning. Me and my stupid, stupid strikes. Brandon Baker held both of his arms up to silence the audience. Now, this is what the audience is dying to know. Why did your partner choose to be on this show? That's easy. Wendy crossed her legs then clasped her hands in her lap. I bid on Chase because we're both realtors. We make sense. Whoops! Brandon Baker bellowed as a horn blared. I'm sorry, Wendy, you were supposed to tell us why Chase entered. We can't accept this answer, so we'll have to disqualify you from this question. Mary Ann? I bit down on my lip. Trevor entered so he could help the Founding Friendships Charity, which is a homeless outreach program. He believes strongly in philanthropy. Trevor arched a brow at me. Mary Ann bit on me by complete accident. She actually tried to get out of dating me multiple times. The audience gasped and then moaned. But I'm glad I didn't. I blurted out, then turned to Trevor. My eyes burned suddenly and I brushed his cheek softly. Meeting Trevor was the best date by mistake a girl could ever ask for. As the audience broke out in applause, Trevor leaned over and kissed me again. My insides warmed at the feel of his mouth on mine and the competition faded away until all there was in the world was our kiss. I never wanted the moment to end. Okay. One last question. Brandon Baker's voice startled me, but he was apparently eager to get on with the show. What do you think is the most important thing to your partner in a relationship? Wendy made a humming sound. I think Chase values honesty above everything else. Wendy wants someone with passion.
Chase sounded so earnest I wondered if he knew this from words or experience. Hmm. Mary and wants someone who plays by her rules, Trevor said. But I think what she needs is someone who is smart enough to see past them. I turned to him with a frown. You have no idea what you're talking about. I want someone who tells me things up front. Not someone who plays games. Trevor narrowed his eyes at me. He asked what I thought, not you. And what do you think I want, Marianne? You claim you like impulsive, but who you really want is someone who's sweet and perfect, I said, glancing over at Wendy out of the corner of my eye. I don't care about perfect. A line appeared between his brows. Where are you getting that, he asked, sounding annoyed even though we were still on camera. Just my opinion. I leaned back in my seat, crossing my arms over my chest. Okay, Brandon Baker drew the word out as if he hadn't expected our attention. Surely, though, the production staff already knew about Wendy and Trevor. Well, thank you all for participating in the truth and love. We may not always like the answers we hear, but honesty is one of the most important aspects of a lasting relationship. That concludes our show for tonight. Remember that you can vote at home either via text, phone, or online. Vote now. As soon as we were off stage, Trevor turned to me. What is the matter with you tonight? I rolled my eyes. Sorry, but we knew that we weren't right for each other from the start. Didn't we? That's why we had to make our strategy. Well, I'm tired of faking a relationship. You already struck out and that's fine with me. You just use that rule as an excuse to push people away. Like you're doing to me now. Trevor nearly growled as he spoke. I'd never seen him so upset, and it took me aback. Glancing past him down the hall I could see Wendy waiting, pretending that she wasn't listening to us fight. Whatever, I snapped. Go have fun on your real date. She's waiting for you in the hall. What are you talking about? Trevor followed my gaze. As understanding seemed to dawn on him his head snapped my way. Wendy is my realtor. She just sold me a house, which I tried to tell you about earlier but you wouldn't listen to me. But, hey, thanks for your faith in me. I stared after Trevor's retreating form in horror as the reality of the situation washed over me. Third strike. I was out. Chapter 9 the following Saturday night, I stirred the vegetables that were sautéing in the pan on Ginger's stove. In honor of the final segment of Romance Revealed airing tonight, she had made chicken wings, which were my favorite. Melinda couldn't be here since she was picking up her boyfriend, Nate, from the airport because he just returned from photographing some extreme adventure in India. I hadn't heard from Trevor all week and I felt miserable. Not a call, not a text. Nothing. A visual replay of my relationship's crash and burn wasn't on the top of my list of favorite activities, but I'd managed to watch the first three segments the past three nights and I couldn't not watch the finale. You're still sulking so I assume you haven't heard from Trevor? Ginger asked, squeezing my shoulders as she passed by to grab something from the fridge. I totally blew it with him. I know that you're perpetually disappointed in me but could you spare me the lecture tonight? I stared hard at the pan, watching the oil surrounding the vegetables bubble. What do you mean? I could hear the surprise in my sister's voice, and it was enough to make me look up at her. She seemed to be genuinely puzzled by my statement. You're perfect and I'm the screw-up. I shrugged, hot tears stinging my eyes. Everyone knows it. Ginger came to stand beside me. Mary Ann, what are you talking about? Nothing. Just forget it. My stomach turned sour, and I couldn't believe I'd said anything in the first place. You can't say something like that then not tell me what you mean. 
She stopped cooking, and when I looked up at her I saw something sad in her expression that made me change my mind. It was like that even when we were little, I mumbled. My heart pounded so hard I thought it might make me pass out. Terror pulsed through my veins. Like the time I was riding my pogo stick in the house, and I knocked over Dad's friend's beer. You know that guy who was always around and drunk with Dad? Well, he got so mad that I'd spilled his beer. Her brows rose. What? I closed my eyes, biting my lip. He pushed me so hard I flew back and hit the wall. My back bruised up pretty badly. Why didn't you ever say anything? Ginger asked, horrified. Dad had told me not to ride my pogo stick in the house and I did it anyway. I shrugged. I was wrong. I know I didn't deserve that, but still. Nobody deserves that. She gave me a one-armed hug, cradling me against her. You should have told me. I could have helped. I shrugged again. I didn't want to start a fight by telling her that I doubted she would have done anything. I know telling people is the right thing to do, but as a kid that was too hard. I've still had a problem with it as an adult, which was why I wanted Grammy's bracelet to make me strong and brave like it did when we were kids. That's why you wore her bracelet while pretending to be Wonder Woman? Her eyes flickered with understanding. Oh, Mary Ann, you don't need that bracelet to be strong and brave. You're already those things. You just don't realize it yet. That's exactly what Trevor said. Tears pricked my eyes again. And I did stand up for myself at work. I really did. And what happened? I bit out a laugh. I got a promotion. You see? She brushed my hair back from my face like she used to do when I was little. Sweetie, I am so proud of all the things you've accomplished. How you paid that rent back to me, and how you have been working hard at your job, and even doing this show. I would have been scared to death with all those cameras pointed at me. You looked completely comfortable, like a natural actress. Really? I fluffed my hair on either side. Should I prepare for a future Academy Award then? She chuckled. You can do anything you set your mind to, Squint, she said, using the nickname she'd given me when I was little. You're the most vibrant person I know. I wouldn't want anyone else as my little sister. Ginger wrapped her arms around me in another hug. I love you, sis. I sniffed, my throat tightening as I savored the moment. Then I released her and gathered myself together while she dished up our dinner. As we sat down on the sofa, Ginger said, you know that guy you were talking about? Dad's friend? He pushed his kid more than once, and Dad called CPS on him. They never hung out again. I didn't know, I said, suddenly feeling lighter. Maybe my dad would have taken care of me but I hadn't given him the chance to. After all, Ginger and I seemed to have bridged an invisible gap that had existed between us. I dug into my food as I watched the beginning of the show. This episode televised our final quiz show date, then summarized all four of our dates and started showing scenes that I hadn't even realized had been recorded. They showed Trevor and me at the cafe, the attraction between us obvious. Then they played Wendy and Chase doing their own plotting at the bar of the Jeffreys Hotel. The two of them truly had no chemistry, though. Can you believe that I thought those two were the perfect couple? I asked. Ginger giggled. They have about as much chemistry as a chicken wing. I felt a pang of sorrow because Chase and Wendy did appear to like each other, but he couldn't seem to get her away from her work. No wonder her face was on all of those billboards across the city. The girl was a workaholic. During one scene before we'd filmed the scavenger hunt, he had pulled her aside. Listen, Chase said to Wendy, I was wondering if you'd like to go out with me tonight. Perhaps a late dinner? 
Wendy gave him an irritated look. I told you I have a showing. Maybe some other time? After they showed the scavenger hunt, they cut to a shot of Trevor and me talking about how we were going to spend our prize money. They showed me being surprised by his generosity, but what I saw on Trevor's face as I talked about Grammy's bracelet wasn't the way I'd remembered it. He seemed to be admiring my reason, like I had truly touched him. I hadn't noticed that at the time and it made me miss him even more. I had no idea you were willing to spend $22,000 on Grammy's bracelet, Ginger said softly. I didn't realize how much it meant to you. Grammy's bracelet means the world to me. It's like a piece of her or something. I know that sounds silly. No, it's sweet. Her eyes watered and she squeezed my hand before turning back to the TV after a commercial break. Instead of going to the next date competition, they inserted a scene with Trevor saying, you don't need your grandma's bracelet to be brave, muffin. You can do that all on your own. Then the camera switched to a shot of me, saying, I don't know that. I do. I'm sure Grammy believed in you, too. She just used the bracelet as a reason for you to believe in yourself. Ginger reached for my hand as she watched the scene play out. Oh my goodness. He's wonderful. She was right. He was wonderful, and in contrast to that the next scene showed Wendy and Chase talking about how they planned to spend their prize money. Wendy said, I'm going to add to my stock portfolio. Can you imagine how much it will grow with that kind of additional investment? Chase rolled his eyes, not even bothering to conceal his preference. He said, I'm looking to buy a ski and slash ski out condo in Tahoe. Can you imagine how rad that would be? Who even says rad anymore? Ginger arched an eyebrow at the screen and I giggled. The show wrapped up with Brandon Baker facing the camera. The live studio audience is voting here. But you viewers at home can call in for the next 10 minutes while we give you an inside look on Founding Friendships, the homeless outreach charity that benefited from this auction. Votes will be tallied, and then we will announce the winning couple. The segment on Founding Friendships made me feel sad and happy at the same time. Sad to see how many families were affected by homelessness as Trevor's family had been, and happy that such a helpful charity existed. Interestingly enough, Ginger's friend Jill Parnell had started the organization, which was now a booming success. Finally the show went to commercial. When it came back the camera zoomed in on a close-up of Brandon Baker. Now the moment we've all been waiting for, as the drum roll sounded out of the TV speakers, my name suddenly flashed across the screen alongside Travers. My breath hitched, and Ginger squealed. We won. We really won. I shouted, bouncing on my toes. Ginger threw her arms around me and we jumped onto the couch screaming and saying incoherent things. Through tears, we hugged each other over and over. You need to go after him. Ginger gripped my arms, giving me a stern look that was more like the know-it-all sister I knew and loved. You're brave and that guy is worth fighting for. You can do this. Maybe, I said, wondering if I should call him to congratulate him. I mean, he wasn't exactly phoning me at the moment. Sigh. I'd blown it with Trevor, and he clearly wasn't interested anymore. What are you going to do with the prize money? Are you going to buy Grammy's bracelet? Ginger asked. I, I don't know, I stammered. That's what I had planned to do all along if I won the money, but now I didn't think that was the best choice. When I searched my heart for what I should do the answer instantly became clear. I was going to donate my prize money to the Founding Friendship's Homeless Outreach Program so that the funds could help people the way they'd help Trevor's family. Closing my eyes, a warm feeling washed over me and I knew without a doubt that Grammy understood my decision. I also felt her whispering that she was proud of me. I sat in my car for a moment, staring at the $25,000 check in my hands. 
This was probably the only time in my life that I'd have this much money in my possession at once. Let's face the facts, this would buy a lot of freaking massages. Yet. I didn't feel the pang of sadness that I thought I'd feel when I decided to donate the money to founding friendships. Maybe Trevor had rubbed off on me or maybe I had actually grown as a person. Maybe a little of both. I got out of my car and headed into the studio. The show asked me to give Founding Friendships the check here so they could film the donation for their follow-up segment. Once inside, the director of the homeless outreach program, a guy named Bob, greeted me with a huge grin. This is very generous of you, Mary Ann. Bob shook my hand, then a photographer snapped a picture of me signing over the check. So, what did you think of the show? Theodore Rollins, Romance Reveals producer, asked me. I know you had some reservations about dating The Bachelor initially. A bittersweet pang hit me as I handed over the check. With a wistful smile I thought of Trevor. The show was the best time of my life. As I drove away, I felt good. I knew I'd done the right thing and that Grammy would have understood my decision. Still, I needed to see her bracelet one last time. Just to say goodbye. The drive to the jewelry store was short and I managed to find a nearby parking space along the curb. My cell phone rang as I was getting out of my car, but I ignored the call since I was on a mission. I strode into the jewelry store, nodding to greetings from salespeople as I went to the exact display where I'd seen Grammy's bracelet before. Taking a breath, I peered behind the glass. I scanned inside several times, only, the bracelet wasn't there. Panic gripped my chest, making it hard for me to breathe. Trying not to run, I hurried toward the first employee I saw. There used to be a bracelet in that display cabinet and I need to see it. Ah, the Arthur Arrington. I'm sorry, miss. But we recently sold that piece. If you'd like to speak to the owner about it, I can get her for you. Yes, please, I murmured. When the owner caught sight of me, I caught her eye roll, but I plunged ahead. I know it's asking a lot, but do you think I could have the name of the person who bought my grandmother's bracelet? I just want to see it one last time. To say goodbye. You know I can't do that for you. A gentleman bought the bracelet for his girlfriend. It would be unprofessional of me to give you his name and highly intrusive of you to track him down. I know that bracelet meant a lot to you but it's time to let it go. I knew she was right, but that didn't stop tears from pricking my eyes as I thanked her for her time and walked out of the store. Grammy's bracelet was gone. I'd blown it with Trevor. I'd never been so brave in my life, nor as miserable. Pulling out my phone I listened to my voicemail from the call I'd ignored. It was a message from my insurance agent. We were just informed that the claimant's car is ready for pickup. I just got off the phone with him since he'd called to thank us. Can you imagine? He's on his way to get his car now, which prompted me to thank you for the police report and for your cooperation in getting that done. You'd be amazed at how many people don't follow through with important details. They just hand each other their insurance cards, which often creates such a nightmare for us. Anyway, thank you again. We also wanted to let you know that since your policy has accident forgiveness and since this is your first accident your insurance rates won't go up. Hope you have a nice day. Nice day because my rates wouldn't go up? Ginger would tell me I should be happy about that but I was beyond sad. Who cared that the claimant had called to thank her when I'd lost the one guy I'd ever truly cared for? My breath hitched as I realized that the woman had been talking about Trevor. He was the claimant. I had nearly forgotten that the accident was how we'd initially met. I thought he was so stuffy and formal at first, which actually turned out to be true. He was totally that way, extra careful and cautious, because of the many challenges that his family had faced when he was a kid. His past hadn't just made him stuffy, though. 
it had also made him sensitive. He could see others suffering, and he wanted to help. There weren't many people like him in the world. I swallowed hard against the pain of losing him. I glanced back at the jewelry store. There had been so much loss for me lately, and yet I had also gained a lot too. I had learned that I was capable of more than I'd ever thought possible. I could be brave when I needed to be, and now I knew I'd always had that ability. Grammy had recognized that all those years ago, and she'd given me the bracelet so I would believe it too. Only I'd misinterpreted things, thinking I needed the object instead of relying on what was inside of me all along. Thank you, Grammy, I whispered, glancing up at the sky. Then I darted to my car for what I needed to do next. The auto body shop that the insurance agent mentioned Trevor had used was only five blocks away. The call hadn't come that long ago, which meant I might still have a chance to catch him if I hurried. I didn't have a plan. All I knew was that I had to try something. I felt like I was in one of those action movies with an epic car chase scene as I squealed to a stop in front of the auto body shop, nearly running right into Trevor. He'd been walking from the auto body shop's office and stood in the parking lot, staring at me as if majorly surprised. But he knew I could be impulsive and he'd liked me anyway. I yanked my keys out of the ignition and scrambled out of the car. There was a clouded expression on Trevor's face, and I worried that he wasn't especially thrilled to see me. And yet, there was something in his eyes that made me hopeful. I almost hit you again. Wouldn't that be ironic? I asked with a slightly hysterical giggle. I doubt I'd rank very high on your risk management assessment, huh? I mean I would be a high risk. I can't just go around ramming into cute guys whenever I want to meet them, can I? I paused to take a deep breath, my throat tightening as I decided to be the bravest I'd ever been by saying how I truly felt even though he might reject me. I'm really sorry I jumped to conclusions when I saw you at lunch with Wendy. I never should have doubted you. Can we start over? Pretty please with a biscotti on top? Trevor had a slight frown on his face, and I wondered if I was too late. I wanted to shake his arm and force him to tell me what he was thinking, but instead I just held my breath waiting for my fate as my heart pounded wildly. He stepped toward me, gaze intent on mine. I don't want to start over. His tone was firm and hearing him say those words was like having someone crush my soul. Maybe crush was too nice of a word. I felt shattered when he reached for me. I'd rather we just go from here, because getting rear-ended by you is the best thing that has ever happened to me. Tears blurred my vision and I was so confused. What are you saying? A small smile tugged at the corners of his mouth. I don't want to start over because I don't want to lose all we've built. You're the most amazing person I've ever met, Mary Ann. You're bubbly and fun. And honestly, you've made me realize that there is so much more to life than keeping everything neat and tidy and safe. I, I don't know what to say. I babbled, shaking my head. I thought I'd lost my chance with you for good. You're going to have to give me a chance to wrap my head around this. He took a step closer and lifted my hand. You've taught me to reach for the things I love. Like how you kept reaching for your Grammy even though she's physically gone. I glanced down to where his hand held mine, astonished that he was telling me that I had helped him when he touched my life in every way possible. His thumb brushed the top of my hand sending tingles up my arm. Thanks to you, Mary Ann, I decided to buy the house I've had my eye on for a while now. I hadn't wanted to purchase a home, because of my fear of losing it like when I was a kid. But you taught me that taking risks can bring the best things in life, and disasters can too. Like being rear-ended by you. My heart was hammering so hard in my chest that it actually hurt. I tilted my head, giving him a side glance. I've missed you, hot stuff. His gaze pierced mine. I've missed you, too. 
I let out a nervous laugh, realizing how lucky I was to have rear-ended this wonderful man. Then I swallowed. I went to see my Grammy's bracelet. Just to say goodbye, you know? But it was gone. And all I wanted to do was call you, and curl up in your arms. I'm sorry you were sad. He pulled me to him, holding me against his chest. I know how much her bracelet meant to you. You know what? You taught me a few things too, I said with a shaky smile. My emotions were threatening to overwhelm me, and I was determined not to cry. Like how I can love an object, but people are more important. Specifically you are more important. We stood there staring into each other's eyes until a car beeped that we were in its way and we had to move to the sidewalk. Trevor kept caressing my hand with the pad of his thumb and delicious shivers danced along my spine. I was amazed at how connected to him I felt. Not just in that moment, but in every way. It was a connection that stretched out in every direction, seemed to consume every thought, every emotion that I had. Besides. I shrugged, glancing up at him. Even though Grammy's bracelet was gone, I had already donated the money to founding friendships. You did? Trevor seemed surprised, but his mouth curved upward and I could tell how much it meant to him. That's incredibly generous, especially since you were giving up something that meant so much to you. Like I said, you mean way more. Besides someone I admire a whole lot gave me some perspective on why helping others is more important. I really admire you for doing that, Trevor said softly. That means more to me than you'll ever know, Mary Ann. You made such a hard choice. I shook my head. It wasn't hard, though. Not when I thought about you. Thank you, Muffin. He brought my fingers to his lips in a gentle kiss. Family and love are important, though, and I never want to minimize what Grammy's bracelet means to you. Meant to me. I sighed, closing my eyes a moment. I've made my peace that it's gone now. You know, I think Grammy would have approved of the way I spent my share of the prize money. Me too, Trevor agreed. But you know what else I think? I gazed up at him, swooning and happy. Hmm? He brushed my cheek. I think she'd want you to have her bracelet too. My brows came together in confusion as I watched him reach into his jacket pocket and pull out a small, velvet box. My heart fluttered. What is that? A gift for you, he whispered, his voice deep and gravelly. I cracked the box open carefully. Inside on the velvet sat the most beautiful piece of jewelry I'd ever seen, a bracelet with connected gold circles, each one containing a sparkling ruby in its center encrusted by diamonds. Grammy's bracelet. Trevor, my eyes watered immediately. What? How? After the scavenger hunt, I went back to the jewelry store and bought it for you. His gaze held mine, all of the emotion alive between us. You stole my heart, so I thought it was only fitting to give you a piece of yours that was missing. I feel the same way about you. My hand shook as Trevor clasped the bracelet around my wrist. The metal hummed against my skin as if knowing it belonged there. So where do we go from here? Anywhere we want. Trevor grinned as he cupped my face in his hands, then pressed his mouth to mine in the sweetest kiss I'd ever known. He brushed his lips against mine over and over. I didn't know where we were headed but for the first time in my life I felt safe and strong, loving and being loved. The End If you enjoyed spending time with these characters, be sure to read Wendy's story in the Second Chance in Blue Moon Bay series, Book 1. You have been listening to Date and Dash, Better Date Than Never series, Book 10, by Susan Hatler, copyright 2015 by Susan Hatler, audiobook copyright 2023 by Susan Hatler.
Susan Hatler is a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author who writes humorous and emotional women's fiction and young adult novels. Many of Susan's books have been translated into German, Spanish, French, and Italian. A natural optimist, she believes life is amazing, people are fascinating, and imagination is endless. She loves spending time with her characters and hopes you do, too.